This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. Hello and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicke and as always I'm here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Hello. Hello. Yes, we're doing it. It feels like we should just figure out something that we say at the start of the podcast because I always panic and end up just saying hello for a long time. It's a great catchphrase. Yeah. I really like it's taking off out yeah. there on the streets. I've heard a few people say it. Get out, have you? Yeah, so that's pretty cool. <gasps> Am I an influencer? And I wink at them and say, Jess Perkins, and they say, who the fuck is that? Who? <laughs> I might steal, maybe I'll steal uh, Ben Russell's thing where he just says who he is at the start of the episode. So Dave will go, uh, Matt just here, and I'll say, I'm Ben Russell, but only I'll say I'm Matt Stewart. No, I think say I'm Ben Russell. Yeah. Okay. Just take it from him. Bit of fun. Yeah. I'll Aretha Franklin him. <laughs> Make mine. it your own. That's mine now. Oh, Ben doesn't have a name now. <laughs> I think I just lost my name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's block. It is deep into block now. Michael, yeah. we're in the home stretch of block. It's the 21st of block today as we release it here in Australia. Wow. Our fourth episode for Blocktober, which if you're not familiar with, for the third year now, we uh, do a little thing for the month of October where we count down our most requested or most voted for topics that year. Put Matt put 100 topics out, some of our most requested stuff, and the top five have been picked and we're up to number two on that list. Two. Crazy. It's blockbuster Toba. Blocktober. Blocktober Grace period mm. is the big month of the year. Everyone's partying all around town, all around the globe. It's huge. And every, there's one question on everyone's lips. What are you doing for block? Mm. Mm. Which should be pretty apparent because if you're asking them, you'll see what they're doing for block. Yeah, you're probably doing the same thing. Probably having a fiesta. I'm doing it right now. Or, or similar. Yep. A barbecue. Barbecue. Uh, you know, there's uh, so many options. You can and do what I just did this morning and um, just order yourself a box of pastries to be delivered and then just eat them all. Are they yeah. Are they there yet? Yeah, mate, they're gone. Are they eaten yet? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, crap. I mean, Dave, I mean, not to date this podcast if you're listening in the future, but right now we're not allowed in the same room. Um, so I couldn't have shared even if I wanted to. And if I... If I could, I wouldn't have wanted to. Yeah, thanks a lot, government, costing me pastries. <laughs> it's gone too far. <laughs> yeah, Once it's not... costing pastries, yeah. <laughs> then there's got to be another way. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're up to the second most uh, voted for topic of this block, and it's one that's been suggested for a long time now. Um and actually, I went into the old hat. It was not in there. So it's it's not, yeah, for some reason, I think we didn't do uh, these types of topics in the early days and what great times they were. No, but once you <laughs> open Pandora's box, you can never stop. Yeah. People are like, oh, yeah. I like that. Fuck that one. Do more of that. Well, I was just thinking it's interesting the, the spread of topics that we've had so far for Block. You know, where we had like the O.J. Simpson trial and the Donna Party, and then Robin Williams. Like it's been a it's been an interesting spread, but of course, there's got to be something a bit fucked up in there. Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't know what your takeaway from the O.J. Simpson case was, but or, or the Donna Party where they ate each other. Or... Okay. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm hearing it now. Mm-hmm. There's some thread there, but they're all in America. As well? Right. Well, yeah, and I think we're staying there because usually what we do is we take it in turns to report on a topic, usually suggested by a listener, and the person doing the report, they go away, do the research, they bring it back. The other two don't know what the report's going to be, but because we had to divvy up these top five topics, Jess and I actually know what Matt's going to report on this week. So do you have a question yeah. to get onto topic? or I we... do have a question for those who have been able to click on this episode without looking at the title. Uh, Jess and Dave, no fucking around required. Just give us the answer when I ask the question. Who was one of the most infamous serial killers of all time and at one point known as the campus killer? All right, Jess, are you going to say it or are you going to say it? Big Bird. Ooh, close. Um, Don't say, no fucking around, just give me the answer and then expect us to not fuck around. Big Bird's a, do you reckon? 
Big Bird had it in him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> big time. What's All right. he got? None of them big wings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, no A more fucking around. Come on. The answer is, of course, Bed Tundy. <laughs> Lock it in. Final answer. Bed Tundy. Woo! You are so close. Oh, uh, really? What do you mean? It was actually Ted Bundy. Oh, oh no. So close. Oh. Matt, are you sure that's right? Because yeah. I think it's Bed Tundy. Have you looked that up, mate? Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I've been reading and watching about this guy too much. but And I hadn't picked up bed any Bed Tundy, but everyone seemed to at least refer to him as Ted Bundy. Okay, well... Okay, but what You've was done it? the research. But well, what was his birth name? Uh, I'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> still, okay. There's still Not, hope. Yeah, we can find out for sure there. <laughs> um, a warning if people aren't familiar with him. Uh, this is a very messed up topic. I didn't really know anything beyond he was a serial killer, an infamous serial killer, so uh, it's been a real eye-opening week. I'm not going to go into the graphic details of his crimes, though, because, you know, at the basis of this podcast. It is a comedy podcast. There's other podcasts if you want to hear about that sort of stuff, you could. Yeah. And I'm not trying to downplay it, of course, but the assaults were super violent. They were sexual in nature and necrophilia was involved. Yeah. I'm not, but I'm not going to go into any of that stuff really. Yeah. I think that's fair enough, especially when you think um, that uh, there are real people involved. Yes, of course. Mm. And um, yeah, we... Normally get a few comments uh, down the line, usually from people who, you know, there's a, a few hundred people watch, uh, listen to this on YouTube, mm. usually, maybe a couple of thousand. And there's all, that's the only place we get comments of uh, questioning details and stuff. And for some reason, it's just, especially on the murdery episodes, people go around and just listen to every podcast about it and go, oh, um, that's actually not quite right. Why are you listening then? This is not for you. Yeah. If you're an expert on Ted Bundy, you're not going to learn anything new. Uh, I understand this is a weird mishmash, comedy and Ted Bundy. We do our best. That's for us to navigate, you know. We're, we're trying pros. to keep everyone happy. <laughs> yeah. Our listeners want this topic. They asked for this. We've got to put our own kind of brand on it. And anyway. <laughs> Good luck out there on the field. Um, so this topic was suggested by a lot of people. The names I found were Ryan Backer, Naraj, Daniel Spring, Roby Dotavi, Mariah, Seth Hicks, Ratcatcher McLean. Can't be a real <laughs> name. Hope it is. Odin. Hopefully, do you think that could be the god Odin? I think uh, so. Michael Lucci or Luce, Taylor Vifquine, Lexi Frustacci. Karen Holly, Alex Green, Jacob Duff, Carl Mabry, and Douglas Greenwood. Something I've just just to kick it off, I've I found this kind of interesting in my reading. Um, some people there's a, a lot of varying information on a topic this big. There's so many articles and everything out there, so there's a bit of varying uh, information. And in a few of them, they said uh, that the term serial killer hadn't been corned by the time Bundy was committing his crimes. He said it hadn't been corned. Mm. Coined, sorry, bit of an accent thing. I know us over here in the West <laughs> have a slight different accent to you coined. in the Outlaws. <laughs> but do you eat coin on the cob though? Yeah, oh yeah, good time. Love it. Sweet. I'm coin. making coin fritters for dinner this week. A bit rough on the teeth, but make it work. Um, but yeah, it it, uh, it seems like it had been coined, but just wasn't in common usage as yeah, yet. Okay. According to an article. Yeah, apparently, like in Germany, it was being used a similar term in the 1930s. Um, but anyway, uh, according to an article in Psychology Today, up until the 1970s, serial killers were generally, generally called mass murderers by both the criminal justice system and the media. Today, however, we draw a clear distinction between serial murder and mass murder. Unlike serial homicide, which is manifested in a number of separate events, mass murder is one, a one-time event that involves the killing of multiple people at that one location. Isn't it a, a nice sign that we need to be able to break the kinds of big murders into different uh, subgroups these days? Mm. Um, yeah, I love the idea of a killer being like, um, actually... Okay, I'm not a mass murderer. Yeah, come on. I'm a serial killer. Come, I'm not, okay. uh, come on, I'm not crazy. <laughs> uh, Bundy 
fell into the serial killer category. Um, it's not known for sure who Bundy's first victim was, and a lot of people seem to think that the the murders happened before the documented ones. But his first known victim was Karen Sparks. According to Oxygen.com, before the attack, Sparks at the time, uh, a, a student at the University of Washington, said she remembered seeing an older man staring at her in a nearby laundromat. I'd look at him, he'd look away. I didn't really think too much about it, Sparks said on a TV special called Ted Bundy, The Survivors. In the early morning hours of January the 4th, Sparks said she'd been reading in her bedroom at the campus home she shared with three male friends at around 1am when she thought she saw a man peering into her bedroom window. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing some guy looking at me and I thought, gosh, you know, Maybe it was just a figment of my imagination because it was so quick, she recalled. It was just a flash. And I thought, well, no, nobody's going to hurt me, you know. I'm living with these guys, you know. I mean, who's going to hurt me? She was living in a, a share house with multiple um, housemates. Karen Sparks is Ted Bundy's first known victim, but unlike many of the women he murdered, Sparks survived her encounter with a notorious serial killer and she believes she was spared for a surprising reason. Sparks believes that it was her male roommate talking in his sleep next door that spooked Bundy and prompted him to flee before he took her life. I think that's why he didn't haul me away like the other girls, because Chuck talked in his sleep, and I think that's what saved me, Sparks said. Bundy snuck into the room after Sparks fell asleep, beat her and violently assaulted her, sexually assaulted her before her roommate Chuck began to talk in his sleep. Sparks was left unconscious and bleeding in the bed for hours until about 7pm that night when her roommates came down to check on her. Her housemates called an ambulance thinking she had fallen down the stairs and it wasn't until she was at hospital when it was realised what had happened. Sparks was unconscious for 10 days in hospital what? and woke with no memory of the attack. Um, back to the Oxygen article, Sparks had suffered 50% hearing loss and 40% <gasps> vision loss as a result of the vicious attack, which had primarily been focused on the left side of her head. Although the doctors suggested the family send Sparks to a nursing home, her father insisted they bring her back home and nurse her back to health. Sparks recalled, I remember talking to my dad and I said, gosh, you know, I'm not going to be the same person I used to be. And he says, no, you're going to be even better. Wow. Sparks went on to become an accountant and had a family saying, I never did really think of myself as a victim per se. I mean, sure, I was victimized, but I'm no victim. If you think of yourself as a victim, you're a victim for the rest of your life. And that's the most crippling thing of all. I've heard people complain about me sleep talking before. Never again will I take yeah. that again. No, I could be nah. saving people's lives. You're welcome. Yeah. My snoring could be saving this house. Yep. Because you know what? You know what my snoring tells potential intruders? There's people in there. That's right. <laughs> that there's a there's a vicious animal in there. No, it's just cute yeah. little old me yeah, people, snoring my guts out. Oh, my God, this house has a pet tiger. <laughs> I'm going to go next door. <laughs> That's right. That's why my neighbours keep getting robbed, but I've still got all my possessions. <laughs> <You're> like, ah, <laughs> ah, <laughs> wow, yeah, that is amazing that... But also, you said that she wasn't found till 7 p.m. So was she just sort of there unconscious all day? That's what, that's how, how it reads, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so fair enough that they would check on her after. Has anyone actually seen her today? Yeah. Maybe we should check her room. Um, but, wow, amazing that she survived and, and had such an incredible outlook. Yeah, like you would not blame anyone for letting that ruin her life. But she even said that. Um, she every day, she never had a bad day again because she just took every day as if it was at the last. I'm like, holy wow. shit, you're a saint. Wow. Yeah, you're incredible. I, yeah. I suppose it would also only sort of get worse because this person I imagine is about to be in the news more and more and more and more, so it would be constantly in your life. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the interesting thing at the time was that it took a while for connections to be made. I was, mm. It just it feels like the term serial killer wasn't in the common lexicon, but even, the idea of it seemed to not really be as well. Yeah. Even though it seems like there had been cases throughout history. Uh, I was reading that, you know, they 
some people talk about it like it's a modern modern phenomena, but then others are like, nah, it's been happening forever. Some of those olden days um, stories about werewolves and vampires, they were just people trying to make sense of serial killers. Right. Yeah, and going straight to farcical creatures instead of assuming that a person could do it. I mean, yeah. we, we've definitely had it in other serial killer reports where it sort of takes police a while to go, oh, this could be the same person. And then once they make that link, then others kind of are more apparent. But it doesn't tend to be sort of their go-to, you know? Yeah, and it seems like that was the case here. Sparks did say that her dad cottoned on pretty quick and he was collecting newspaper articles for the murders and he seemed to be um, ahead of the game a bit. Wow. And there there are, uh, I mean, you got to put yourself in the, the detective shoes, but um, they did seem like they got tip offs before really putting it together themselves. I guess they've got to work to a different level of evidence that, than mm. um, others do. And you get a million tip offs, some of them are going to be right. And in hindsight, you're going to be like, oh, fuck, we wish we treated that more seriously. Yeah. Sadly, most of Bundy's victims didn't live through his attacks. Uh, the vast majority he, he killed at the time, um, and only a month after the attack on Sparks, Linda Ann Healy was taken from her bedroom in a very similar attack. Healy was also a student at UW, the University of Washington, when she was attacked and murdered on February the 1st, 1974. According to History 101, Healy was a stellar singer and applied herself to her studies with fervour. As a psychology major, she made it her mission to work with adolescents with mental disabilities and disorders. She also worked for the school's radio station as a skiing area weather reporter. On January 31st, the evening before her disappearance at 11.30pm, she popped into one of her housemates' rooms to chat, seeming happy and undisturbed. Um, They just had a chat everything according to her housemate she's like yeah she seemed on top of the world she'd just been out to the pub for the night um then at 12 a.m her housemate said she went downstairs to her room and that was the last time that anyone saw her alive the next morning her next door housemate barbara little was woken up by healy's 5 30 a.m alarm she had to get up to do the ski report for the radio um and healy normally would turn it off obviously but the alarm didn't stop ringing. So Little poked her head in to check on Healy and she was nowhere to be found. At first, Little didn't figure that Healy was any kind of danger. Besides her ringing alarm, she didn't notice anything disturbed in Healy's room. Her bed looked pretty neat and the rest. However, all of her housemates began to worry once Healy's boss asked why she never showed up to work. She also missed a family dinner that evening, prompting a worried call from her parents. Her housemates decided to investigate and in Healy's room, they found that some of her bedding was missing. Additionally, blood was on the sheets as well as on one of her nightgowns, which had been hung up back in her cupboard. Oh. Uh, After discovering that the back door was unlocked, her housemates called the police. Uh, Authorities also struggled to determine whether or not foul play had occurred despite the blood, which it's just like, wait, what? Mm. Uh, um, Healy's room was neat and in order besides the traces of blood on her sheets. However, the bloody neck of her nightgown led the police to believe a crime had occurred. In the light of the minimal evidence, police struggled to grasp onto a lead. Fire out. Just sort of disappeared into the night. Yeah. Another thing that, you know, I had to sort of remember as I was reading through this, that there were no such things as DNA testing and other tools modern homicide investigators have at their disposal now. Mm. So catching the culprit was a a much, much harder job. Isn't that amazing? Like that's 74. So that's something that's come in so recently, relatively, you know, like 74 is not that long ago. Yeah. To then go, because it's us in our modern mindset, like why don't they just DNA test it? (laughs) Yeah. But that's so new. What does that take, about 11 seconds? Yeah. To go through the entire Uh, planet? Because they've all got to... Yeah. Just tap it into the database. Right. There were no databases. Yeah. How and something amazing. we'll talk about more as we go along. It's just like there was no system connecting the different police forces around America and they just um yeah, it was it's come on so quickly mm. in 
recent decades. It's a lot harder to be a criminal now, you could argue. Probably a yeah. good thing. Yeah, good thing. That's, yeah. My, that's my hot take. But unless you were born mm. wanting to be a criminal, you'd be like, well, I was born too late, you know? Yeah, should have been born at a different time. Yeah, We've all right. said that. We've all said that. You know, I'm a child of the 60s, mainly for the killings, but. <laughs> also for the music. Yeah, I mean, that's a bonus. I was going to be called the Beatle Killer. <laughs> oh, that was a Beatle Killer, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Was it? Oh. Well, I guess the guy who killed John Lennon. Mark David Chapman in the Yes, but okay. But again, too late. Too late. They'd already been broken up for 10 years. Yeah. According to Inside Edition, which I think is a bit of a like a tabloid um, crime news show, but they also cover like entertainment and stuff. But anyway, I found an article of theirs really good. I imagine America's like Inside Edition. <laughs> Why are you quoting that? Why are you quoting from E! News? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think it might even be a company related to E! News. But anyway, I found this article I referred to a bit and it, it was quite good. Uh I started out going, I want to give all the victims a bit of a, a rundown. I want to talk about them. But there just is, because there's so many, I, yeah, I, I I don't stick with that, unfortunately. And I do apologize. Um, anyway, Inside Edition covers some of the next murders uh, here. After Healy vanished, young college women quickly began disappearing. On March the 12th, Donna Gail Manson left her dorm room to go to a jazz concert on campus at the Evergreen State College in Olympia. But Manson, who was 19, never made it to the show. On April the 17th, Susan Elaine Rancourt also went missing while on her way to her dorm after meeting with advisors at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg. Then on May 6th, Roberta Kathleen Parks left her dorm with plans to have coffee with friends at the Memorial Union in Oregon State University in Corvallis, but she too never arrives. So at, the, at that point, they're happening, the disappearances are happening every three or so weeks, up to wow. a month or so. And then the disappearances increase. Fuck. On June the 1st, 22-year-old Brenda Carol Ball vanished after she left the Flame Tavern in Burien. Uh, this isn't the most important thing, but I, I'm going to butcher some uh, American place name pronunciations, I'm pretty sure. Um, so she left the Flame Tavern in Burien. She had hoped to get a ride home with a musician, but he was going the other way and she was last seen in the bar parking lot talking to a brown-haired man with his arm in a sling, witnesses said. Doesn't this make you just go, it doesn't matter if... If they're in a different direction, just give them a drive, lift. Give them a lift. drive oh, people home. I'm sure yeah. that poor person would have was thinking about that for the rest of their life. Yeah. yeah. So I, th- I mean that. Yeah. I. There's things that have happened in our world that make it. Everyone talks about it now. Like after comedy shows, if anyone needs a lift, give them a lift. Yeah. On June 11th, University of Washington student George Ann Hawkins vanished while walking down a brightly lit alley between her boyfriend's dorm and the sorority house where she lived. So I mentioned there, or that article just mentioned how the man approached uh, Brendan Carroll Ball with his arm in a sling, mm. and that that's something that happens a lot. That's like a that's a tactic he uses to sort of um, feign some sort of vulnerability. I guess he makes him seem like less of a threat. Oh, you're yeah. less, less scary because like, what's this guy going to do? Yeah. yeah. And apparently, I haven't seen it, but apparently um, the killer in Silence of the Lambs uses that and that's where they got it from. Oh. Wow. At first, the police had little to go on. It seems like they didn't see a lot of connecting, uh, a lot connecting the cases together, but they became more and more concerned as the number of missing women grew. Netflix released a four-part series about Bundy in 2019 called Conversations with a Killer, the Ted Bundy Tapes. It's one of many, many documentaries about him and other um, fictionalised sort of biopics as well. Uh, One of the main talking heads in this series was a journalist named Ward Lucas. And he's one of those great American TV journalists with those that sort of big voice. It almost sounds like he's a Harry Shearer character, you know. (laughs) He he could almost be real-life Kent Brockman. Wow. has just a one of those perfect voices. It feels made up. He must have learnt it at some point. He couldn't naturally talk like that, surely. <laughs> but anyway, like he, I mean, can you I'm, imagine him as like a seven-year-old with that voice? Yeah, I I was on his website, wardlucas.com, 
And something jumped out at me, so I thought I'd mention it in his uh, short bio here. Uh, it says he's won many awards, all sorts of these sort of things. But two of his um, claims to fame was he was the first reporter on the Ted Bundy murders and also the first reporter on the D.B. Cooper hijacking. Whoa! Oh, wow. Isn't that wild that someone would have, like, two of the biggest crime cases yeah. of the 20th century and he was, or at least claims to be the first reporting on both. That's, That's wild. amazing. He's got to be in some sort of crime hall of fame for that reporting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it said that he's won uh, 70 awards for reporting and writing, so... Um, wow. And yeah, he he seemed he was one of the a journalists who was closely closest tied to this case for sure. Anyway, he he said that in the early days of the investigation, he was called in by the captain of homicide in Seattle, Herb Swinley, and Swinley wanted Lucas's opinion, and he wanted him to help brainstorm ideas and possible lines of inquiry. This sort of shows how desperate they were. He's calling in journalists to get their thoughts about it. I guess it's but smart to just try whatever you can. Lucas remembered he was researching various religious cults to try and attach it to various kinds of occult calendars and witchcraft, Satanism, human sacrifices. They had no hard evidence, no descriptions of potential suspects. They were desperate. And uh, can I just wow. ask a question? Has any bodies been found at this point? No, These people just no vanish. Yep. Wow, that would be <laughs> really hard to investigate. Yeah. So I get yeah to them they're not even necessarily murders yet. They're just they're missing. still missing persons. But look, and then looking at the victims, they're trying to figure out what connects them, and nothing seemed to connect them particularly. But they were mainly uni students uh, in their late teens or early twenties. They had brown hair, and it was usually parted in the middle. So it's a very specific looking person. If maybe they weren't connected to each other otherwise. At least physically, they were That's quite similar. Yeah. You know what? My this is so dumb. My brain went straight to it's the seventies. Everyone had their hair parted in the middle. <laughs> it's just a fashion at the time. Yeah, I that's think that's why I was like, probably, well, that's everyone. <laughs> that probably would have been part of it, but I yeah. think um, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm no. The seventies was so long ago for me. I can't yeah. remember. Oh, it, no, know. I wouldn't expect you If you remember you to. the seventies, were you really there? You know what I, mean? <laughs> I do know what you. I think I know what you mean, actually. <laughs> According back to Inside Edition, two women attending Central Washington State College from where Rancourt had vanished told reporters that they were approached by a man wearing an arm sling who asked if they could help him carry a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. Oh, yep. But a distinct car. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first incident occurred three nights before Rancourt disappeared and the second happened on the night she was last seen alive. So he was working this area for days. The morning after Hawkins vanished, three Seattle homicide detectives and a criminalist scoured the alleyway for clues but found nothing. Police appealed to the public for help and witnesses came forward saying a man with a leg cast who was on crutches, was seen in the alley of a nearby dorm and struggling to carry a briefcase. A woman noted the man approached her and asked for help carrying the case to his car, which she said was a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. So, that, I mean, to me it's like, well, here's, this is a pretty, these are pretty good leads now. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a, you've got a general kind of description and a pretty specific description of the car. Mm. Uh, what I didn't realise was I'm like, geez, that, that's a pretty rare car, surely. But according to one of the cops who was investigating, at that time there were 42,000 Volkswagen Beetles registered in Washington State. So now you'd be like, oh, well, it's Greg, the guy with the Beetle. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah, the only one sure. in town. But then it, I, I had no idea they were such popular cars. But of those 42,000. I, I would love a Beetle. They're great. They're really cute. Yeah, they're very cool. Especially the old ones. Yeah, the old ones are sick. But of those 42,000, how many were tan? One. <laughs> but they were like, nah, it's not worth looking into. Because even even the factory was like, really? You want it tan? Tan? Custom. Custom tan. I know. And tan. <laughs> Everyone else wants colour. All right, yeah, sure, I guess. We can make it tan for you. Are you sure, though? <laughs> it's a pretty cool, funky car. Are you sure you want the yeah. most boring colour? We can do, like. Six different colours. <laughs> and you want yeah. 
tan. All right, I'm just checking. You want the car to be the same colour as the leather seats inside? Really? Okay. Okay. Tan's such a boring colour that they used it to describe average people in the nanny theme song. Yes, you're right. She's the lady in red. Whenever everybody else is wearing wearing tan. tan. Boring. (laughs) Yawn. That's what they should have called the colour tan. Yawn. <laughs> I'll get you mine in your one, please. <laughs> how, how hard do you reckon it would be to rebrand the name of a colour now? Mm. Mm. I mean, it depends how how powerful you are. How powerful do you consider yourself, Dave? I suppose if you were, how powerful is your Instagram If you're a Turkman bashy, you can change words to whatever you yeah. like. But yeah, I suppose. Mm. I reckon if you were Michael Jordan or someone like that, like someone uber famous, you could just go, hey, I just thought of a real cute idea. Let's start calling Tan Blur. <laughs> Who's with me? And then all of a sudden everyone just goes, yeah, I'm in. Blah. And you, like, you create a hashtag or some kind of TikTok yeah. challenge and everyone will jump on board. So one of the big sort of corporates gets involved, Coca-Cola, yeah. do, do Blur cans for yeah. a while. <laughs> get it in Blur. <laughs> Limited edition and then everyone has to go out and get their Blur cans. Oh, it's so Blur. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I reckon it's possible. All right, let's yeah. do it. Let's get on that. So we just got to get uh, Michael Jordan and Coca Cola on board, and we're all like, easy, yeah. easy peasy. Give me, give Is me till Michael Monday. Jordan, <laughs> you know, Michael Jordan, a very modern, yeah. famous person that the kids are yeah, into. Every eight year old's hero, Michael Jordan. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Yes. Oh, Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> I'm talking uh, about any Michael Jordan from North Carolina, not the other one. Oh, Why would please you do don't that? Why would you do that? <laughs> Sorry. I've just been told that every block topic so far, North Carolina has come up. So I just thought that was my that was my one way to get it in, maybe. All right. Well, he uh, Michael Jordan did wear blue shorts when he played for North Carolina. This is a fact you might not know. And then, <laughs> but he kept wearing them even when he was playing in the NBA for Chicago Bulls, but he wore them underneath his red shorts, meaning he needed bigger, baggier red shorts. And that kind of changed basketball fashion, short fashion, history forever. That's why they wear right. So he big was powerful shorts. enough to change short fashion. Surely he's powerful enough to change the name of the color tan. Yeah, I reckon. Surely, I don't think tan has a, a big sort of pressure group or anything like that. <laughs> big tan. Big tan. You'd never cross big tan. <laughs> There's a, a famous running track in Melbourne called the Tan, mm-hmm. soon to be known as the Blue. <laughs> <laughs> Made me spit all over my microphone. <laughs> well, that's how you feel after running it. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, back to the grimmest topic yeah, we've ever done. Back to horrific killing. So you were saying that yeah, they've got a solid lead finally, right? Yes, but you know, there's still there's still forty two thousand of these cars out there. Mm. So presumably it's solid, but it's not. Most of them are driven by a man with a cast on their leg and an arm and a sling. Mm. Yeah, perhaps they're, they're, yeah, maybe they were thinking, oh, we're looking, maybe they were going to hospitals going, who's had a broken <laughs> leg recently? I'm, yeah, that's a good point. I do not even thought about that. Would you assume that it's real? Uh, the sling? Yeah, yeah, I think you would initially, yeah. I was going to make a dumb joke. What you said, it's solid. Damn it's it. not that solid. And I was going to be like, like jelly. Like think of it like jelly. Oh. You could put something very light on top, but anything like heavy card. is going to sink. Like a little lead statue of Dave's nose. Yeah, if you put a lead statue of Dave's nose, that's going to sink. Which would be a weird thing for you to have, but it worked as a good example in this case. <laughs> uh on July the 14th, just over a month after George Ann Hawkins disappeared, two more abductions occurred, and these were the most brazen yet. The Lake Sammamish State Park in Ithaca was crowded with families enjoying the summer sun when, according to Inside Edition, and talk about crowd, I'm talking about thousands of people mm. are at this sort of summer resort, swimming and it's not a resort, you know, the summer um, State Park. Um, Janice Ann Ott, a 23-year-old probation case worker at the King County Juvenile Court, was last seen leaving the beach with an attractive young man. About four hours later, Denise Mary Naslin, 19, left a picnic at the beach to use the restroom and never came back. There's something 
I don't know if you've seen photos of this guy, but people always describe him as attractive. I'm like, I don't see it. Mm. Apart from the fact that he's got uh, one of those heads that looks different from every angle. Every photo of him, you're like, oh, that's the same guy? Yeah, one of those. Oh, is that why he's able to get away with it? I, re- I, I really think that helped him. The we- the head that he had uh, helped him get away. Well, in part, I mean, there's all sorts of factors that helped him get away with it. People just saw him as a normal guy and normal guys can't be murderers is another thing that helped him. He's not unattractive. Right. But, he, but he, is he noteworthily attractive? No. But he just looks like a fully average person to me. Yeah, yeah, he's pretty average. He's not unattractive, but he's not drop-dead gorgeous. But also, you know, different time, photo quality back then, maybe not so great. He's got the whole um, serial killer dead eyes thing going on, which I'm quite acutely unattracted to, to be honest. Mm-hmm. The image that they use on Wikipedia, just so we can all look at the same, same image. Mm. Does look, he looks like he's got that crazy look in his eyes like Christoph Waltz does when he's playing a crazy person. Yeah. Yeah. And right. is that hot? He just no. looks scary to me, but maybe that's because yeah. I know what a scary motherfucker he is. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I would say that his looks are not his value. No. <laughs> but with a, bit, with a bit of facial hair and a smile, I, he's okay. He right. must just be charismatic, like all cult leaders. Yeah, they do say that as well. They say he was quite charming. Yeah. Uh, but I've there's a lot of video of him talking and he just seems like a fucking loser to me. But anyway, yeah. like they've said, I'm probably projecting what I already know about him onto him. Ah, nah. I fucking hate him. <laughs> and I I'm, I make no apologies for that. No, should um, you? Denise Naslin's mother was interviewed uh, for the Netflix series saying about 9 o'clock that night, I saw that her boyfriend came pulling up in her car and I knew right then that something was wrong. And I said, and he said, I can't find Denise. All I can think about is what were her thoughts? How long did she suffer? And those thoughts are with me all the time. All these victims, that's, you know, their fam, all those families, Mm. obviously horrible for so many different people. And that's the, one of the shames about a podcast like this. I'm focusing on the fuckhead way more than the people who were really affected by it. Yeah. And th- you hear Bundy talking later. He's, he re- like, he feels sorry for himself a bit as well. Like, he's been hard done by it. It's absolutely wild. Mm. Kathleen McChesney was a 24-year-old detective who was added to the 11-person task force al- assigned to the case. And she remembered the aftermath of the Lake Sammamish State Park abduction saying... What came out of uh, a call for information was the fact that some of the witnesses at the park had seen a suspect approach both of the women who went missing. There were 40,000 people out here on that day and some of them had been asked by a good-looking young man wearing an arm cast to help load his sailboat on the car in the parking lot. These same witnesses provided information for a police sketch and recall the man with the cast had asked several young ladies for help that day. Another helpful thing the witnesses remembered was hearing Janice and the man introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jan, she said. And he replied, hi, I'm Ted. <gasps> Gave his real name, idiot. Well, his real name's Bed, but... Yeah, that's true. So he's like, they'll never find yeah, me. Um, My actual Ted. name's Bed Tundy. <laughs> How will I ever crack the code? <laughs> <laughs> And Matt, if he'd said my name's Bed and they look up, oh, there's any bed. Oh, one bed. <laughs> oh, Reckon go. we got him. One bed who owns a tan car. <laughs> I'm like, mm, he looks different from this angle. <laughs> We're going to rule him out. Inside Edition elaborated saying, they said he spoke with an accent described as either Canadian or British and wore a white tennis outfit. He had his left arm in a sling and asked for their help unloading a sailboat from his tan or bronze coloured Volkswagen Beetle. Four of the women refused to help, and the one woman Rude. who agreed to help. <laughs> I mean, imagine reading, you'd re- be reading about this the following week going, holy fuck. Yeah. I'm never helping a stranger ever again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you know the way to? No. No, I don't. Get out of here, killer. I don't speak English. <laughs> it's interesting, right, because you just, you never assume. Of course I think, not, yeah. I think you always assume things are, things aren't the worst they could possibly be. But yeah, yeah, a lot of people saw the same man go up to 
women, young women over and over asking him for the same sort of help. Some of them went with him, obviously. Some of them didn't. Why is he only asking yeah, women? Like, like a couple of strong... In hindsight, you'd be like, oh, there's some weird things going on here. Yeah. A couple of strong guys are like, oh, we can help. He's like, no, thanks. No, thank you. Yeah. No, thank totally. you. I want this small woman to help me. That was like, I just remember this recently. I was telling a friend about this. I once did a trivia gig at a high school. It was like a maths-themed one for uh, Year 7 and 8 kids. And then I had to carry my PA in all the way from the car parks, quite a long way. And on the way out, the teacher running it, who was so oblivious to how everything (laughs) was going, so funny. Anyway, she goes, oh, do you want some help carrying your stuff to the car? And I said, oh, actually, that would be nice. She goes, oh, sure, sure. And she goes... Every kid in the yard, she goes up to this kid who was the smallest child I have ever seen. Dave, is it you? <laughs> and then she goes, oh, he'll help you. And honestly, the speaker was bigger than him. I, I didn't know what to do. You're like, get me a year <laughs> 10 minimum. I know. I had to hand him like a pencil case or something and be like, thanks, thanks, mate. Thanks so much for your help. Appreciate it. <laughs> I thought, Good job. I thought she was taking the piss, but she just didn't get how uh, strength works. So. <laughs> you looked down and the boy was you, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, th- uh, thank you. That's it. How awkward is that? Just make everything. Uh, th- uh, thank. No, it's all right. You don't want to seem oh, um, ungrateful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I don't want to like. You don't want to give the kid a complex <laughs> and be like, he can't do it. <laughs> this kid, this two foot. And he four. might surprise you and be an absolute little tank. You don't know. But he wasn't, was he? He wasn't. In this case, no. So you're like, he, he's just holding, putting his hands on the side. You're carrying the full weight. <laughs> yeah. Having to. Just save his feelings. Oh, you're doing a great job. Good job. Mate. Couldn't have done Thank this you without so, you. Wow. Even though I honestly have already done that by carrying it in without you. But I, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> you were with me in spirit this morning. <laughs> the article goes on. It says, the fear in Washington was palpable now. So early on people weren't necessarily connecting them, but these, especially because it was in broad daylight, I don't know, for some reason this made it seem more real to people too on the same day and then it all started adding up. Um, The number of young female hitchhikers dropped sharply and the pressures mounted to make an arrest. After posting flyers in the Seattle area, King County Police were able to create a composite sketch of the suspect and his car. It was printed in newspapers and broadcast on television. And it was a a pretty good likeness of one of the angles of Ted Bundy. (laughs) The, the, sadly, the, the rear angle. <laughs> yeah. Detectives were bombarded with tips, receiving up to 200 per day during their sweeping investigation. Several would prove to be essential in catching the person responsible. Uh, two women named Elizabeth Clofer and Anne Rule and a professor who taught psychology at the University of Washington all came forward to call attention to one man who fit the profile, Ted Bundy. Wow. And I'll I'll tell you more about uh, those three people and how they know Ted soon. But let's go back to the start. Who is Ted Bundy? Um, he was born Theodore Robert Bundy or Beard Beardore Robert Tundy. Thank you. <laughs> in Burlington, Vermont, Dave, your favorite. Oh my state. goodness! He, is he one of the more famous people to ever be born from Vermont? Yeah, I guess it's him and. Uh, the guy who lost... Oh, Bernie Sanders. The... Bernie Sanders, yeah. <laughs> Bernie and Bundy. Um, <laughs> I think quite different characters, the two. Yeah, I don't know if, if Bernie Sanders wants to be associated with Ted Bundy. <laughs> Sandy Banders. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about it soon because they were definitely on opposite sides of politics because um, Bernie being a... He was a Democrat nominee. Bundy, tell you about soon, involved in the Republican Party. Wow. Hmm. Um, so he was born on November 24th, 1946. His mother, Louise, gave birth to him at a home for unwed mothers. Uh, apparently his parents were very religious. Um, his, uh, her dad was quite violent, apparently. Uh, his birth certificate lists the father as unknown. There's different theories about who it could be. There's multiple people who they suggest, but no one knows for sure. Uh, according to biography.com, to hide the fact he was an illegitimate child. Bundy was raised as the adopted son of his grandparents and was told that his mother was his sister. So he thought his grandparents were his parents, mm-hmm. his mum was his sister, which is a story you hear about a bit back in the day. Yeah. Uh, Eleanor moved with Bundy to Tacoma, Washington, a few years later and soon married his stepfather, Johnny, Johnny Bundy, 
who he took the name of. Johnny Bundy. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently Johnny Bundy was a great, great dad. Sure, but you can't have a name ending with Y and then Bundy. John Bundy, fine. Johnny Bundy, stupid. You know what? You have fully made me doubt that <laughs> that's right. Because <laughs> it is that doesn't work, does it, Johnny Bundy? It's a different time. Yeah. They didn't have the the sense, the nouse that I have now. Whereas Johnny Rose from Fantastic. Schitt's Creek. How good is that name? So good. So good. Johnny Rose, I love it very much. What was Johnny um, Johnny Bundy's middle name? Was it Ronnie? Johnny, oh, Ronnie, Johnny Bundy. Ronnie. Terrible. <laughs> that sounds great. It sounds like the start of a nursery rhyme. Johnny Ronnie Bundy yeah. putting in a pot, <laughs> kissed a boy and had a good time. <laughs> but you're saying, so you're saying that he was a good dad? Yes. Well, I go. believe so. His granddad was not a good dad, mm-hmm. but I believe Johnny was a good dad. Obviously, I was not there, but that's what I had When read. his sister married a man and he moved, is that when he realised that he was, you know, actually... That she was his mum, not his sister? Is that oh, what you my mean? God. I've just... Johnny Bundy's middle name, you ask, Culpepper. <laughs> what? Johnny Culpepper Bundy. Okay. Now I'm a bit more on board. Yeah, back on board. Oh, wow. That's an amazing one. So I I miss what you were saying there. Oh, so when he moved with his, what he thought was his sister in with her new husband, is that when it was revealed to him that the sister was actually his mum? I... Or was he just... I don't know when it was, because I read it, he was an adult before he found out, I think. Right, so he's just living Uh, with his his sister and brother-in-law. I think that, I think that's what happened. But yeah, this is where someone on YouTube is going to angrily comment. (laughs) They're like... Everybody knows. Well, then why are you listening? Yeah. If you already yeah. know everything, why are you listening? It can't be for the riffs. They're dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come As on. you'll tell oh, us. Come on. Come on. Tell my story, recording my story about a very small year seven was absolutely amazing. <laughs> that was fantastic. Hey, that, that wasn't that weren't my words. I'm just quoting a, a previous comment uh, from a YouTube. I did a whole riff as someone at the Volkswagen factory, surprised <laughs> oh. that someone ordered beige. Oh, come on. That was, uh, to this me, that's a great bit. This has been great stuff. That is good stuff. We've got the perfect balance here of grim and gruesome and awful and a bit of fun. That's right. So that arsehole on YouTube with zero subscribers to their own name can fuck off. Oh, Dave's looked into them. <laughs> <laughs> you always click on them. And they've got they've got four uploads from seven years ago when they tried a musical career and it did not take off. <laughs> You're not talented. Stop. <laughs> we are talented. Thank you. We'll continue. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, that does sound sad, but is it as sad as three podcasters who have their feelings hurt by an anonymous <laughs> commenter on YouTube? I'm not sure. Nah, Matt, I don't they think... They don't really hurt my feelings. I'm just like, why are they wasting their time? Matt, I'm a big fan of self-awareness and self-reflection, but in this case, they're in the wrong and we're okay. fucking great. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> From all appearances, Bundy grew up in a, con- a content working-class family this is still from bi- biography.com. He showed an unusual interest in the macabre from an early age, though. Around the age of three, he became fascinated by knives. He was a shy but bright child. Uh, he did well in school but not with his peers. As a teenager, a darker side of his character started to emerge. Bundy liked to peer in other people's windows and thought nothing of stealing things he wanted from other people. Oh, Okay. I mean, that, that started out being like, you know, I love when you walk past a house and the front door's open you're like, ooh, what's it like in there? What's going on in there? Yeah, bit of a, ooh, that's how they live. But uh, stealing from strangers and peering through the window yeah. is a bit much, mate. Mm. Yeah. Uh, according to Inside Edition, Bundy's grandfather was said to be a violent and racist man who took his temper out on his wife and the family. Bundy recalled to uh, a journalist who I'll talk about uh, later, but he's uh, his name's McCowd, I think, and he um, his interview he would later interview Bundy over many sessions, and those tapes made up the Netflix doc or the basis for the Netflix documentary from last year. Um, but and he said to them later, uh, remembered an instance where he threw his daughter Julia down the stairs for oversleeping. That's something that Bundy remembered his grandfather doing uh, to his mum. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. For oversleeping. Yes. So for being tired and, and resting. Yes. Mm. There is also something about Bundy is a kind of an unreliable um, witness. Yeah. He seems to be totally full of shit, but 
Uh, some things he says ring true, and I think they sort of took that to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, from a young age, Bundy's behavior disturbed those around him, including Julia, who said she once woke from a nap to find herself surrounded by knives taken from the kitchen and smiling Bundy st standing nearby when he was three. He just put a bunch of knives around her. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird. That's really fucking weird. Yeah. I mean, you got a three-year-old, if they don't end up being one of the world's, world's worst monsters, you probably go, that was a weird time that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was odd. We had to have a chat about knives but, after that. Yeah. He didn't know. He just thought you used them for dinner. They weren't They weren't dangerous. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. They thought it was dinnerware. Um, <laughs> but do you think, like, they'd still be talking about it if it was, if it was spoons? Like if she'd yeah, woken up surrounded exactly. by three dozen spoons of all different sizes. Because he'd overheard her saying she enjoyed spooning. That's right. Yeah. Because who doesn't? Oh, so good. Little spoon for Find me. Find me a person who doesn't like spooning. They're a serial killer. Yeah. Dave, you you like little spoon? Yeah, little spoon for me. Yeah, Dave's you, little spoon. you'd be a good little spoon, Dave. Thank you so much. I'm just going to pop little Davey spoon in my pocket. <laughs> Matt, you a big, you a big spoon? Uh... I don't know. I think I, I think I'm ambi spooning. Yeah, ambi yeah, spooner. Yeah, yeah you got to share it around, because obviously being the little spoon is the best. But you know you can't be greedy with that. You got to share it around. It's true. And also, I find it hard to face one way for too long. I need to roll to yes. the other side. I need a bit, so you swap. Bit of a roll. Hmm. Love that. Love a spoon. Bundy graduated high school in 1965 before attending university. Firstly, at the University of Puget Sound. P-U-G-E-T. Does that ring any bells to you too? I'm going to say Puget Sound Puget. for a year before. Puget. 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 There we uh, go. Puget. People, people yelling at your iPod, please don't. Don't <laughs> worry no about need. it. Yeah, it's okay. I say some words wrong and I apologise, okay? Don't get angry I about mean, it. There were some comments recently of people getting angry. I mean, you said the word coin wrong before and that was fine. <laughs> That's all right. It's not just place names. It's it's everything. So just leave, cut him some slack here, please. Please, come on. I need this. He's a human being. Oh, come on. If there's anything in this report that you should be angry about, it's not my pronunciation of oh, some right, places. Yeah. Well, who's the real murderer here? The man who murders the English language? Hmm. Maybe. Hmm. So he studied at the University of let's call it PS for a year Great. before moving to the University of Washington to study Chinese. And you'll remember that. Uh, many of the victims we talk about also studied at the University of Washington. Studying Chinese. Yeah. What does that mean? The language, like he was learning to speak Chinese, I guess. Sure. He doesn't stick with it. You don't need to think about this too okay, much. Great. He's, probably, <laughs> he's probably studying Mandarin, probably. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I was like, Chinese isn't a language, no, is it? No, but that's the one that colloquially people do refer to as Chinese. Okay, yeah, right. Well, at least it... Puget Sound. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, that was at, at, at UW. Um, yeah, maybe that was, but I saw that in multiple articles. They never said Mandarin. So I studied Mandarin at primary school. Did you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's cool. In 1967, he started dating a classmate uh, often referred to by the pseudonym Stephanie Brooks. Her real name isn't normally used, and that's to protect her identity, I think. Although... In the Netflix documentary, it seemed to be used and in other articles. But I figured if there's a well-known pseudonym for a name, why Let's go with not? that. Yep. Yeah, let's just use that. Around this time, Bundy dropped out of college and started volunteering for Republican presidential nominee Nelson Rockefeller. And in August of 1968, he attended the Republican National Convention in Miami as a Rockefeller delegate. In 1968, Brooks broke off the relationship with Bundy before heading home to her family in California. She described Bundy as immature and lacking ambition. Conversely, Brooks had everything Bundy wanted, money, class, and influence, and he took the breakup badly. In 1969, Bundy was in Washington again, and now dating a woman named Elizabeth Clofer, who you might remember the name from one of the people who um, tipped the police off mm -hmm. to him being the possible mysterious Ted. Um, Clofer was a single mum who worked at the University of Washington. Perhaps taking Brooks's words to heart, Bundy now appeared to be more ambitious and career-focused. He, he re-enrolled at the University of Washington, this time majoring in psychology and getting good grades. 
1971, he started working at the Suicide Hotline Crisis Center in Seattle, where he worked alongside a woman named Anne Rule, another one of the people who oh. put his name forward to police. Okay. Rule would also go on to write one of the most well-known Bundy biographies, The Stranger Beside Me. <gasps> at the time, though, Rule remembers Bundy being kind, solicitous, and empathetic. Um, she would. She became quite a famous uh, crime writer. Wow. Uh, Do you think that's because so of him sitting next to her? Like that changed the course of her entire life as well? I believe she was already aspiring to be, yeah. so maybe it was just a huge bit of luck. Or, yeah, maybe... That also makes sense. I mean, it'd be a, I mean, you say call it luck. It's a weird kind of luck, mm. but it it does give her a, a real in and a hook for yeah. Her just book. like I just it would have been amazing if she planned to do something else and then was like, well, I'll just write this about him, and then that becomes her, her thing is crime writing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Maybe that is true. I didn't I didn't read that much about it, but I do believe that she is quite a famous writer. And if you take out that he goes on to um, be one of the worst serial killers. Just being motivated after a breakout, a breakup, and really, you know, like turning your life around, and that's great. Yeah, I think that is a, that's a. I mean, take the psycho stuff out of it. That is a positive way to take a breakup. You know, oh, it's a chance for a new start. Yeah. Let's work on me for a bit. Let's see what we can do. That's how I ended to... up in comedy. Yeah, and right. radio. That's why I joined a gym briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's why I travelled sometimes. I, th- I think bre- breakups are the worst times and then they become the best times. Absolutely, yes. If anyone out there is going through a breakup, just this, it, is, oh, man. it sucks for a bit and then everything opens up and you go, wow, anything's possible now. There's some really good stuff coming for you. Yeah. The sun breaks through. Mm-hmm. I mean, a worldwide pandemic is probably not the best time for it, but, I mean, now you're going to have, when we get through both of these things together... Us and you. Hey, we're here for you as a podcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There might be there might be someone listening out there who's like, oh, that, that's exactly what I needed to hear. That's what I needed to hear right now. <laughs> uh, I really didn't think this Ted Bundy podcast <laughs> was going to be so uplifting. I think they should just stop it now, though. Yeah, just yeah, don't worry about it. I think that's probably. Well, don't mess. learn anything else from Ted. <laughs> like, uh, this guy reinvented himself, had a great time, had a good life. I assume the next partner was the one and then yep. happy. And he was like, I, why was I even with Stephanie? I didn't, I didn't yeah. want to be with her. Yeah, grateful for the uh, experience and, um, and you know, she made me who I am right. in a lot of ways. I'm really grateful for her. I wish her the best. Really woke me End up. End of story. Yeah, motivated. And then I volunteered for the Suicide Prevention Hotline. I'm saving lives. Yes. What a guy. I'm doing well, well think- in psychology. <laughs> I think this is one of the one of the many reasons people seem to not suspect him for quite a while. He, he volunteered to help people and he did, he seemed to do a lot of positive things. He was, he was seen as a real up-and-comer in the Republican Party, in Seattle especially. He was, he was uh, yeah, like a young go-getter sort of thing. And he was hot from certain angles. <laughs> yeah, to 70s people. <laughs> especially journalists apparently because that's how they always described him. Um, <laughs> so, so, unbiased reporting, the super hot <laughs> Ted Bundy yeah. took to the stand today. My God, I was drooling for minutes. <laughs> I didn't hear a word anyone said. <laughs> Just look at that chiseled jaw. Oh, my goodness. That monobrow. Mm-mm. Mm. In 1972, he graduated from his psychology degree at the University of Washington with distinction. Uh, you know, good grades. Um during his university years, he worked for Republican Governor Daniel J. Evans as he campaigned for re-election. Bundy made the news around this time when he was caught recording Evans' opponent Albert Rossellini's campaign speeches, and you know was accused of um, political spying. Oh. And it was it was there's a clip of him on the news going, hmm, you know, I'm, this isn't really a, a big deal. I don't know why you're worrying about little old me. <laughs> but apparently, he's just absolutely loving the limelight. Mm. Likes the attention. Uh, yeah. Evans won re-election and Bundy got a job as an assistant to the chairman of the Washington State Republican Party, Ross Davis. Davis described Bundy as smart, aggressive and a believer in the system. I'm going to quote Ted Bundy at times during the report and these quotes come from that Netflix series, from those tapes um, that the journalists 
got, which I'll talk about in more detail a bit later. But yeah, there will be a few bits and pieces from Bundy. Does himself. he keep referring to himself as little old me? <laughs> Who? Me? Little old me? Oh, why me? I didn't know. <laughs> Oh, whoopsie. I don't know why I'm being treated like this. Why am I in this small jail cell? I mean, Ted, you you know, mate. Is there not a penthouse jail cell I could be in? He's like, I'm a very famous criminal. I'm very famous. And I'm innocent. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, mate. Uh, Bundy later said of his attraction to the Republican Party amongst the anti-war movements of the 60s and 70s. See if you can spot the tinge of irony in here. This is what he said. I've always been anti-union, anti-boycott. I guess that kind of labels me of, as somewhat of a conservative. I just wasn't too fond of criminal conduct and using anti-war movements as a haven for delinquents who like to feel that they are immune from the law. I did speak out against these radical socialist types who were just all for trashing the buildings and destroying the university. He, he, that's a quote from jail. He's in jail, as oh, he says. Oh, this is that. post multiple murders. Yeah. Imagine, imagine destroying or damaging a building. Imagine that. Those criminals. Uh, People, fine. Buildings oh are forever. Yeah. Have some respect. While working for the Republican Party, Bundy made friends with a man named Marlon Lee Vortman. Uh, who was another one of the talking heads on the Netflix series. And Vortman said, he was a very nice person. He was the kind of guy you'd want to marry your sister. So he, he said this well and truly after everything you know about him has come out. And his sister's like, pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> um, don't speak for me. And then her actual <laughs> husband's like, what the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> we go fishing together. I thought come we were so well. You think that a serial killer is better than me? It seems like Bundy grew up as a bit of a socially awkward outcast, but in politics he found things to be different. Of his time working with the Republican Party, Fortman said, Ted always fit in wherever he was at. He would go to functions where there'd be some very influential people there and Ted could always strike up a dialogue. These people accepted him. Fortman felt Bundy looked up to him like a big brother. So much so that he wanted to be more like him. Fortman remembered, Ted liked my Volkswagen. He wanted a Volkswagen just like mine. And then he got one just like mine, I guess. Same colour and everything. Oh, okay. And I was going to law school and Ted decided he was going to go to law school too. Uh, One of his psychology professors wrote a recommendation letter for Ted to go to law school saying, quote, I regret Mr. Bundy's decision to pursue a career in law rather than to continue his professional training in psychology. Our loss is your gain. Wow. I don't think I'd be that flattered if someone was like, got the same car as me and and then did everything I did. I'd be like, oh, that's a bit weird. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I It did seem like there was a little bit about Fortman and a few other people in that documentary and others where you're like, you're too proud of your association with this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You he shouldn't at, be. You should you, be removing you yourself. Pu- publicly telling people he looked up to you like a role <laughs> model. Yeah. I inspired this man who went on to be very famous for his yeah. horrific nature. Honestly, I gave him the idea for all these murders. That's right. I killed so. someone first and he said, well, if you did it, I better do it too. Yeah. So anyway, I'm the hero. I mean, that you know, documentary, they always cut them, edit them to make them look like what they want to. That's so sweet, who knows, sweet but, can. It does it does feel a bit, yeah, I'm just like, oh, this is odd, man. Yeah, that is a bit weird. But it was so, I'm, yeah, I'm the same. I'd be like, oh, a bit much, fella. Yeah. All, I'm all for you, like, wanting to hang out and stuff, but the same car, same colour is weird. Yeah, or, like, if the context is uh, I'm in the market for a new car, what do, how do, what do you think about yours? Have you found yeah. its fuel economy is good? How's it run? Is it expensive to service? Mind if I give it a test drive? Yeah, I like that car. I might have a look. Thanks for your help. Probably in a different colour. Yeah, I'll get a different colour. If you don't mind. Yeah, you don't have the you don't have the monopoly of this car, obviously, but I uh, appreciate your help. That's it. That's fine. But yeah, just trying to be you is creepy. So yeah, so the psychology professor wrote that saying, uh, mm. letter saying, our loss is your gain. Well, this didn't really turn out to be the case. Uh, Bundy did poorly on his LSATs, 
which are the law school admission tests. Uh, he was hoping to go somewhere prestigious, you know, think like Ivy League or something like that, Mah- rich mahogany. Yes, Harvard Le- Law leather School. Leather-bound books, that sort of stuff. <laughs> yes. L. Woods, yes. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't able to get into any of those colleges uh, because he did really quite poorly. And mm. instead, he ended up having to take night classes at the back at the old Puget Sound Law School. Yeah. Back in Puget Sound. He keeps getting drawn back to Puget. <laughs> I think that's just to fuck with you in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and even getting in there was probably only based on the recommendations from his Republican Party connections and psychology professors. He must have done quite badly then, right? It sounds like it, yeah. Because, wow. I mean, those recommendations feel like if you doubled those with decent grades, you would have got in somewhere decent, yeah. you'd think. Yeah. But according to Inside Edition, Bundy also worked as assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission. There he wrote a pamphlet for women on preventing rape. No. What? Yeah. Uh, that. What? He also worked at Olympia at the Department of Emergency Services, a state government agency that was involved in the search for the women who uh, had gone missing. <gasps> there he met and dated Carol Ann Boone, a divorced mother of two. And uh, his relationship with her was similar to Clofer, was ongoing. Um, and so when he worked with those people, is that post him actually kidnapping? What, abducting these people or is this before and that? It's Well, it's not super clear. I think it was around that time uh, and a lot of people seem to think that the murders happened before before their, uh, the known cases happened. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I think it was it was ex- around that time. So he's already, he's yeah, it's a wild double life that he's li- living. Oh. Even though years had passed since Brooks had broken up with him, and he was now dating Clofer and Boone, Bundy was still obsessed with Brooks and through all that time apparently was planning revenge. Oh, shit. Four years after the breakup, they got back together and there was even talk of marriage. Uh, But this was all part of Bundy's plan. He led her on so he could break up with her and break her heart just like she'd done to him four years earlier. And that's what he did. He later said, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. Oh, yeah. That is. So it almost sounds like he did all like he, all those things that supposedly was him bettering himself was just to attract her back so he could get her back. What a gross pig. Okay, so if you've just gone through a breakup, the part where you like (laughs) focus on bettering yourself and you like pay a bit more attention to you and, and chase some goals and spend some time looking at yourself that's great. Revenge? Don't. Nah, don't do that. Leave the revenge out. Yeah, leave that uh, out. I'd say, yeah, cl- clean break. Just try try to stop thinking of, thinking about them as much as you can. Yeah. And just move on. Let them get on with their life. They've made their decision. Yeah, it's okay. You might have got bad advice growing up. A lot of some people do about persistence. Yeah, that's Sometimes, terrible advice. And nearly always you've just, you've got to take... A breakup as a breakup. Persistence is really good when it comes to like running, you know? It's hard, but if you keep doing it, it'll get easier. You know, persistence is good with like skills. Uh, it doesn't really apply to other people. Yes. If people are saying no thank you to you, persistence is not the answer. Yeah, that's a weird, that's a weird one that mm. seems to have gotten through. I'll, I'm sure I'll I got wear that them advice down. as a kid. I'll yeah. wear them down until they go on a date with me. What Holy you fucking, shit. If they're not, if if you have to really work hard at it to get someone to go out on a date with you, that that's bad for both of you. Yeah. And it, but it, don't you, like, you hear of um, early marriages in the first half of the 20th century and that seems like what they always were. Mm-hmm. It was almost like part of it. You had to court. You had to keep asking. Yeah. And it was like ex- almost expected that... Uh, the woman would say no for a while. Couldn't just say yes straight away. They had to say no, and that was part of the game. Yeah. But that is not the game anymore. No. And I'm not even 100% sure if it was back then. No. I hope it was. <laughs> yeah, I really point. hope hope that was how it was. And, it yeah. sounds like Matt's been reading the game. <laughs> That's not the game anymore, guys. 
<laughs> Dave, now you're wearing you those shoes with <laughs> yeah. that hat? That's what I know about the game. Yeah. I, I find that so funny. I really hope that never works. It's called nagging. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what you do is you bring down people's self-worth enough that they'll consider dating you. You're still wearing them down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It's, yeah, that's fucking It's real so bad. bad. I have a funny feeling that Ted Bundy might have read that kind of literature. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, back to the fuck story we're talking about. <laughs> so he later said, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her. And that's what he did. He just he just stopped replying. Apparently she finally got through to him after a, a while and said, what are you, what's going on? Why have you stopped contacting me? And he said, I read somewhere he said in a cold voice, he just said, Stephanie, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, mm, gaslighting. <laughs> yeah. Stephanie, you're crazy. I'd, what do you mean we were going to get married? What are you talking about? That never happened. You've made that up, you psycho. <laughs> he sucks. I can't disagree. <laughs> um, so um, soon after they break broke up for the second time, we're getting back to where we left off in 1974. Uh, this is when women started going missing uh, with the victims all having a resemblance to Brooks. I was wondering if she had brown hair in the part in the middle. Yeah. Um, according to Ronald M. Holmes in his book Serial Murder, he wrote, Ted Bundy was a predator on women who physically resembled Brooks. Example, young, white, with long dark hair parted in the middle. So let's get back to 74. The police now have a description of the man. They have a description of his car. They are starting to get a picture of his MO with the casts and asking for help. And they also know that he was introducing himself as Ted, or at least he was on that day. Because I, I think in the police's mind, they must have been like, what are the odds that his real name is Ted? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a fair question. That's the one name they can rule out. I'd be assuming that was a fake name. Uh, the fact that the suspect drove the VW Beetle seemed like a great clue, like I said, but there were... 42,000 of them registered in Washington at that time. So to them, it still felt like despite all the info they had, it was like finding a needle in a haystack. Mm. Um, McChesney remembered, we started with literally a thousand names. Then we looked at suspects who we had with the name, with a name like Ted, who drove that kind of car, whom perhaps people had reported as being a little strange. We put all those things together and we narrowed the number of potential offenders down to 100. <laughs> Whoa. 10% of them are called Ted and creepy. Isn't that what? like, or, and that, yeah, that doesn't add up, does it? <laughs> I mean, do they only have two names back then? What are the odds? 10%. <laughs> Has, it's Ted, Ted and I, I think it was a pretty popular name Ted back then. Ted and Eric. It feels like, um, yeah, it feels like that couldn't have been one of the things they were looking at. A name like Ted, she said. So what is that? What does that even mean, Bed. a name like Bed. Ted? <laughs> We're not ruling out beds. <laughs> so add another 50. Uh, she went on to say, but at that time, we didn't have enough resources to manage the data quickly. Everything was slow. Mm. Of all the tip-offs that came through, Bundy was one of them, <laughs> as we talked about before. But the people who suggested him were very credible. His girlfriend, Clofa, an old workmate, Anne Rule, and an old university professor. They're I mean, you'd think, oh, that. to me, you're getting those people tipping off. You go, oh, th this is pretty strong. According to McChesney, the Clofer call was a big one, saying, the big leap came when we received a call from a woman who said, I'm concerned about my boyfriend named Ted Bundy. You should look at him. Uh, she told police that he mentioned following a sorority girl when he was out late at night and that he would uh, follow people like that sometimes. Now, I'm not... I've read this in diff this uh, this information from Clofa came at different times. Different articles seem to have it all muddled up. I have a feeling that she maybe told them this much later, mm. but anyway, at some point she is told this and and she passed. So he on. told his girlfriend that he'd followed sorority girls that he'd been following people. Yeah, I have a feeling. As I say, I'm like it doesn't add up. That that's too clear of um, uh, a clue. I, I feel like that might have come later. So Stephen McCowd, the journalist who later interviewed Bundy from jail uh, the, with the interviews that formed the Netflix documentary or the basis of it, 
recounted that she found a bag of women's underclothing in his apartment. She found a bowl filled with house keys and there was some plaster of Paris and some bandages. And another time she found a knife under the right front seat of his car. Uh, Clofa also told police that the night that Brenda Ball disappeared, Bundy had been with her and her family, but he left early in the evening and the following day uh, was late to her daughter's baptism. So clearly no alibi mm. through that whole time. Yeah. In fact, he was late to a thing that you wouldn't expect him to be afterwards. So all of this feels pretty damning, but she still wasn't certain, saying, in my own mind, there were coincidences that seemed to tie him in, yet when I would think about our day-to-day -day relationship, there was nothing there that would lead me to think that he was a violent man capable of doing something like that. Apparently he was quite good with her kid. You know, they were almost like a, a little family. Mm. McChesney remembered, we had a lot of women who called and said, I'm concerned that my boyfriend might be this offender. Oh, that is That's so awful. That's so bad. Uh, whether his name was Ted or not, but this Ted was about the right age. He was about the right physical description. He was familiar with the University of Washington because he lived in the university district and he also attended the university at times. He did have that kind of a car, so there were a lot of things that started to add up. They looked into whether or not he had any alibis, but he didn't, and they even had info that tied him to the Lake Sammamish State Park the weekend before the Lake Sammamish event happened. That's the one that I, th I feel like is going to annoy people even more than Puget Sound. Sammamish. It can't be Sammamish, can it? Anyway, according to McChesney, Ted was absolutely a prime suspect. So obviously, what do you do to a prime suspect? Yeah, have, have him questioned or follow, follow him or something. Do something. Okay, well, yeah, they did some of that. The questioning thing, I reckon that's what I would have, I would have get involved in there somewhere. What they did was they did have him followed. They also uh, used a photo of him for a photo lineup for witnesses uh, to ID him. They got eight people, eight eyewitnesses from that day amongst the 40,000 at Sammamish State Park, Lake Sammamish. And of the eight, seven positively said Bundy was not the mysterious Ted. Oh. He's hard to, so how long? Hard to find yeah, out. how long after this event was were they being asked? Because I don't think I'd remember people I saw on a walk this morning. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't soon after. It was a little walk. Yeah, you know, was, and, yeah I don't think I'd remember after. a detailed. Uh, you know, I might sort of go, yeah. There was a guy I walked past, and he was wearing red shorts, but I wouldn't be able to identify his face. And it was amazing that they even remembered that he said Ted. Yeah. Absolutely. Because like, at the time you're not thinking, this is a killer. You're just like, to yeah. yeah. the guy said, that said, can I help him in the car park? You're like, okay. So, yeah, this was a real big blow. The seven out of eight said it's not him. Uh, what, what about so, the one where they like, that's definitely him? I think they were, I, I, well, it didn't say, but I, I, my guess is they said, I'm not sure. So according to McChesney, they had nothing to physically connect him to the crimes. I love McK McChesney... I don't talk about this later, but she climbed up to like third in charge at the FBI. She was 24 when yeah, she was on this case. I noticed that when you said it. I was like, that is young for a detective. Amazing. Wow. I think she was in part brought in maybe younger than she might have been because they needed a, a woman's perspective and they needed a woman to do some of the interviews and that sort of stuff. Yep. But she obviously proved to herself to be quite capable making it that far up in the FBI. Yeah, wow. Just, I mean, I have no idea, but that seems impressive to me because that's like I've heard of the FBI. And it seems like it's it's pretty big. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is she like the Walter Skinner of? Yeah. yeah. I guess she might have even been Walter Skinner's boss. Oh, my goodness. And we are talking the Federal Bureau of Investigation, not female body inspectors, <laughs> right, as those T-shirts yeah. suggest? <laughs> oh, my God. Who's getting around in them anymore? Surely no one. And if you are, you, you're probably wondering, why am I getting so many dirty looks from everyone? <laughs> it's funny. What? It's funny. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, it's you're basically going, I'm a sex offender. Yeah. No. Hey, hey, everyone, I'm a bit of a creep. <laughs> but I'm third in charge as a creep, so. Yeah, <laughs> one of the top dogs of the creeps. <laughs> Honestly, uh, before you do uh, tweet at me, 
Um, I know it. I'm a cuck. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're right. It's just a bit of fun. Bit of fun. Um, sorry, I'm being uh, a bit sensitive. It's probably that time of the month or something for me. What's my excuse? <laughs> I've been drinking so much soy. <laughs> So it was, a, it was a big blow. Um, the photo ID lineup just did not work out. And according to McChesney, they had nothing to physically connect him to the crime. So without the positive ID, they felt they didn't have enough to bring him in. And the police in Washington would never get that chance. They never interviewed him. Wow. I wonder what they would have got if they did interview him, though. Yeah. Like if they didn't have much evidence... Yeah, that's right. I mm. guess you, your hope would be, and they don't know him at all, would be to maybe get something, get him to confess. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's part of their job, right? But, uh, you know, maybe knowing him now and how slippery and smarmy he is, yeah, they probably wouldn't have been able to pin anything on him. Yeah. And they would have been like, oh, he's so attractive and an up-and-comer. <laughs> I mean, look at him. He can, he's talking. That's hot. Little old me. (laughs) So with that, the abductions in the Pacific Northwest stopped. Yay. Matt, do you mind if I interrupt you for a a moment to ask you a question? Uh, Sure. And you too, Jess. Okay. Which of your online searches does the government have a right to know about? Certainly not my search about is this rash normal. (gasps) It's really gross. I would really like them to not um, jump to any conclusions after my very many searches about Ted Bundy mm. uh, this week. Mm. If it would be possible, I, you know, I feel like that's just that's a bit of me time. Yeah, I don't want them to know that uh, about my habit of reading uh, Poirot fiction, if you know what I mean. <laughs> sexy fiction? Quite sexy. <laughs> sexy Poirot fiction. It's not just his head that's shaped like an egg. <laughs> but... The government, they're not going to know about that because we all use ExpressVPN, which Mm -hmm. protects you from hackers, governments, ad companies, ISPs, from having access to your data. You know, ExpressVPN, it encrypts and reroutes your web traffic to any number of countries, keeping you safer and secure. Simply download the ExpressVPN app, click to connect, and boom, you're protected. And a little bonus, and I've been doing a lot of this lately, with ExpressVPN, you can make it seem like you're browsing the internet from a different country. So you can watch any Netflix library in the world that you want. Pretty cool. Pretty That's cool. pretty fun now that international travel is not really possible. You can internationally travel on the interweb. <laughs> now protect your online activity today and find out about how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash do go on. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash do go on for three months free with a one-year package. Finally, expressvpn.com slash do go on to learn more. So around that time, the abductions in the Pacific Northwest stopped and around that same time in September of 1974, Bundy moved to Salt Lake City to start law school at the University of Utah. Coinciding with this move, girls started going missing in Utah. This is from Inside Edition again. Nancy Wilcox was just 16 when she disappeared on October the 2nd from Holiday, a suburb of Salt Lake City. She was reportedly last seen in a Volkswagen Beetle. Melissa Ann Smith was 17, last seen alive, leaving a pizza parlour in Midvale, another Salt Lake City suburb. On October 17, Smith, the daughter of Midvale's police chief, had planned to attend a slumber party that night. Her naked body was found by hikers in a mountainous area nine days after she went missing. Investigators believe she may have remained alive for up to seven days after she had left the pizza parlour. Oh. So I think this is the first body that has been found. Laura Ann Aim, also 17, disappeared after leaving a cafe in Alehi on October 31st. So it's becoming more frequent. Mm. Ames' nude body was found by hikers in American Fort Canyon on Thanksgiving. Uh, Both Smith and Aim had been beaten and sexually assaulted. On November 8th, Carol Deronch Deronch, told police she was at Fashion Place Mall in Murray, less than a mile from where Smith had been last seen alive, when she was approached by a man who claimed to be a cop. 
identifying himself as Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department. The man told Deronk that someone had tried breaking into her car and asked her to come to the station to file a complaint. She, she was telling this story on the documentary. She was looking in a window in a shop when the supposed cop came up to her and said, someone's broken into your car. Like, oh, this is a bit weird. How does he even know what my car yeah. is? But he said he did. And then um, so she went out with him and um, she said, she's like, it seemed a bit fishy. So she goes, I, I can see nothing's been stolen. So don't worry. And he's like, no, have a closer look. And she could tell he wanted her to lean in to have a closer look so that he could knock her out or something mm. or push her into the car or whatever. And she she wouldn't do it. And she, she goes, ask to see some ID. She show, he, he showed her ID and she goes, oh, all right. You know, I, I, guess, I guess he is a cop. And then he said... Um, you need to come down to the station to ID the man. And his car was a Volkswagen Beetle. And she's like, this is weird, but I guess maybe he's an undercover cop. So she got in the car. Oh, my God. And then when she pointed out he wasn't driving to the police station, he pulled over to the shoulder and tried to handcuff her. During the struggle, he put both handcuffs on the same wrist and Deronch was able to open the car door and escape. She saw a passing car. There was a bit of a fight. He had a gun. She got away, got into a car and went to the police station to report it. Apparently, um, she put it together that he was so angry that he just drove to another spot and uh, found another victim instead. Oh, right. So you've seen it on, on year old. News. Yeah, 17-year-old Deborah Jean Kent vanished after leaving a theatre production at Viewmont High School in Bountiful, Bountiful, about 20 miles away from Murray. The school's drama teacher and a student told police um, an unknown man asked each of them to identify a car in the parking lot. Another teen said they saw the same man pacing in the back of the auditorium. The drama teacher again spotted the man before the play ended and police discovered a key outside the auditorium that they later determined could unlock the handcuffs forced on Deronch. Oh, so, shit. Her handcuffs, which she still had, they found a probable matching key at the next crime scene, sort of connecting the two yeah. crimes. I remember I, I, I did watch that doco and I've forgotten a lot of it, so a lot of this is refreshing my memory, but I remember watching her talk about it and just and just thinking, fuck, you got so lucky that she got away, but I forgot that he then went somewhere else and, yeah. and still... <laughs> committed another crime. I I quite I liked how she talked. She was just like she seemed I mean, she just seemed relatively unshaken by it all, mm. which again is wild, yeah. but she just seemed fucking like pretty badass to me. Yeah. Um around that same time back in Washington, a group of students found some human remains in the Taylor Mountain National Park. Remains of six missing girls were found at the same site. The skeletal remains of 21-year-old Linda Ann Healy, 22-year-old Brenda Ball of Seattle, 18-year-old Susan Elaine Rancourt of Anchorage, and 20-year-old Roberta Kathleen Parks from California. Uh, so all of a sudden, all those missing women, they all turned up um, at the same place. So if there was any doubt in the police's minds that these crimes were connected, that was out the window now. They're obviously all um, connected. Just a few miles away from the place where those four were found, police identified two other murdered girls um, or women, 23-year-old Janice Ott and 18-year-old Denise Nasland, who were the two women who disappeared from Lake Sammamish State Park. The bodies were because they were out in the wilderness, animals, that, that's why it was in quite a short amount of time and only skeletal remains yeah, right. were there. So or it was already back before DNA evidence and stuff. So any chance they had was of, of figuring out what had happened was kind of gone because mm -hmm. they, um, yeah, there wasn't much left. 
Uh, according to Inside Edition, in November, Bundy's on-again, off-again girlfriend, Clofa, again called police in King County, Washington, after reading about women disappearing in towns near Salt Lake City where Bundy now lived. Detectives interviewed her in detail as Bundy had risen on the list of potential suspects in those Washington cases. Clofa also called the Salt Lake uh, County Sheriff's Office in December to repeat her concerns about Bundy. Bundy's name was added to their list of suspects in Salt Lake City, but investigators found no credible evidence at the time linking him to the crimes in Utah. While in Salt Lake City, Bundy was door knocked by a Mormon, and after expressing an interest, he ended up getting baptized and joining their congregation, attending church meetings and activities. Hmm. He became like a real popular member of the of the church. Apparently, uh, in 1975 in Colorado, women started disappearing in a similar way to Washington and Utah. Colorado shares a border with Utah. Mm-hmm. I had to look that up on a map. <laughs> There's so many states in America. I, I, I can't keep I track. I don't realize how close they are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, this is from the Netflix doco. On January the 12th, January, on January the 12th, 1975, Karen Campbell disappeared from the Wildwood Inn. Karen Campbell was a young woman on vacation with her fiancé and his children. Uh, She sat with her fiancé, Dr. Raymond Godowski, in front of a fire in the lobby of the Wildwood Inn. They had just finished dinner at a restaurant, the Stew Pot. Miss Campbell wanted a magazine from her room. About 8 o'clock in the evening, she caught the elevator to the second floor, and that was the last time Godowski saw her alive. 36 days later, her nude body was found almost three miles away, Though the body was partially destroyed by animals, the coroner was able to establish that Miss Campbell had died about two hours after the dinner at the stew pot on January the 12th. There are at least two other killings in Colorado, Julie Cunningham, a 26-year-old woman from Vail, and Denise Oliverson, a 24-year-old from Grand Junction. I'm just wondering what he what he's saying to get these people away from like, from like a public sort of area like that. Yeah. She's gone to get a magazine. How is he... Oh, my God. Yeah, it's it's insane. I guess we'll never know, but you just think mm. about all those. It's amazing that no one's seeing anything, no one's being super sus about it. Like, And he's, he's, done, yeah, so, he's like done it he's so many times, so many times. Hidden in plain sight yeah. almost. Yeah. Like people do notice him but they don't they don't think till later. Like, oh, yeah, was this no, guy? Actually, that was a bit odd, yeah, yeah. now I think about it. Mm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so many times because obviously each time, yeah, you know, it just increases the likelihood of people catching you, but he just keeps getting away with it. Yeah. yeah. And you'd think with all these similar spates of murders occurring in different locations and with the knowledge that Bundy had been in the vicinity of all of them, mm. the various police forces would be working together. But apparently it just didn't work that way. For whatever reason, information wasn't being efficiently shared across state lines. According to Insider.com, through a modern lens, it's easy to forget the kind of pitfalls that law enforcement officials worked under then. Modern forensic science techniques simply didn't exist. Hair and fibre analysis was standard practice and was not yet considered controversial, as it would be decades later. DNA testing wasn't yet a thing. Just in terms of long-distance communications, this was a time before even something like fax machines were around to quickly transmit information, let alone email. Instead, most of the time, you picked up a rotary telephone or sent a letter by postal mail. So, you know, it did take days to just get a message across and then one back again, you know, have a conversation, take weeks. Finally, the FBI's VCAP program, which links state and federal law enforcement resources to apprehend exactly this type of behaviour across states, didn't come into being until 1985. I wouldn't be surprised if this helped bring on such things. Yeah, wow, not till 85. Yeah, fascinating. That's so recent. Yeah. Yeah, probably some people who aren't even that old were alive then. No, um, no so well, what, people who tell themselves yeah. they're not that old. <laughs> people so, go, I'm young, I'm hip. Like people who, for example, like hang out a lot with 30-year-olds would be like, I'm young, but you're not. You just hang out with people so much younger than I'm you. Trying to bring down the average of the group. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not me because I'm, I'm as old as time, but. Um, some of our listeners, you've certainly hurt their feelings there. <laughs> <laughs> so what brought Bundy unstuck? Uh, and like you hear about a bit with these cases, 
It was a bit of luck, really. On August the 16th, 1975, at 2 a.m., Bundy was observed by a highway patrolman named Bob Hayward driving his VW slowly and suspiciously with its headlights off. Bundy tried to speed away, but Hayward chased him down and made him pull over. And because he failed to stop, Hayward was able to charge Bundy. And when he searched his car, he found a ski mask, which Bundy said he used for skiing. Apparently, he was a big skier, Bundy. Um, He would steal skis and forge ski passes. So he found a ski mask and he said, the rest is just normal stuff you find around the house. The rest was pantyhose, rope, an ice pick, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, and the front passenger seat had been removed, which police later determined made kidnappings easier to facilitate. According to Insider, this led to the police being able to get a warrant to search his apartment where they found more evidence Uh, Karen Campbell had been abducted from the Wildwood Inn in Colorado and Bundy coincidentally had a Colorado ski resort guide with the Wildwood Wildwood Inn marked on it. Okay. The town of Bountiful housed Viewmont High School from which Debbie Kennard disappeared after attending a school play. Bundy had the play's program in his position. What the fuck? (laughs) These are like, and I won't go into it, but he kept some body parts as trophies at times. So these these do seem like, on my yeah, amateur reading of it, these are like trophies to him. Perhaps. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Souvenirs and... Well, see, just like, I just like student theatre. I just got to support the, the play. I love the arts. Yeah, I love the I'm arts. I'm a patron, Look so... Sue me. Mm, Sue me. Yeah. Oh, if that's a crime, lock me lock up, me officer. Up. Mm, being a connoisseur, <laughs> guilty as charged. <laughs> as they're cuffing you. <laughs> He's like, oh, no, I, I didn't mean that really. No, I didn't mean that. I meant in terms of loving the arts. I was being sarcastic. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, my God. Should I call a lawyer? But according to Insider, these things they found, while definitely suspicious, police still couldn't prove anything at this point. What? He's got still an ice pick in the car. He's got an ice pick in the but car. But he's a skier. I mean, yes, I've also taken the passenger seat out of my car, um, but that's just for convenience. It's a two-door car. You can't get into the back seat. Sometimes transport small boulders around. <laughs> I'm amazed that he stuck it out with the the Volkswagen Beetle. Like, if you want to yeah. be a long term serial killer, surely you're varying up the car a bit. Totally, right? especially when it keeps coming out that it's somebody who drives the exact car that you. Yeah, have. like that's in a lot of papers now. Sure, I know he's moving around, but each time you move, wouldn't you just be like, "All right, I'll get a Corolla this time" or something? Yeah, go for a Isn't Corolla. It amazing that it's almost like. To him, and and basically seems in reality, it felt like moving states back then was like moving to a different reality. Mm. He's like, I'm, it was just I'm like they had now. no real connection. Yeah, start again. Mm. So the best part of a year had passed since Carol Deronch escaped from Bundy, and she'd been living with it in the back of her mind. She's going, "What the hell's going? Why haven't they found him yet? It's been nine, ten months, and nothing, no word." She said her her dad slept with his um, shotgun under his bed. They were they were obviously spooked by it, yeah, and worried that maybe he was going to come back or who knows. Then she got a call from the police saying that they had a suspect and asked her to come in to identify him. When he came in for the lineup, the police noticed he'd changed his appearance entirely from when he was arrested a <laughs> couple of days ago. Wearing Groucho glasses, <laughs> <laughs> basically, uh, he had. He'd cut his hair, he switched the part from one side to the other, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but really he just had this ability to change how he looked. Every photo you see of him, he looks like a slightly different guy. Deronch remembers going in for the lineup, saying, they brought me to the police station and sat me down, and they had, they had them walk out and turn around and talk, and I recognised him immediately. The minute he walked in, when I saw him walk, I knew it was him. Busted oh, fuckhead. Should have gone to drama school and learned to change his gait as well and his accent. Hello. <laughs> oh, well, that could I be him. That couldn't be him, surely. Bundy's new friends at the Mormon church were stringent defenders of him. They couldn't see how the Bundy they knew could have done the things he was being accused of, even hassling Carol de Ronch about it. And she recalled them doing well, one lady doing it. I remember running into a woman in my subdivision. And she had said, you know, Carol, are you sure you have the right guy? She was questioning me just because he was a college student and charming, good-looking, smart, and it was frustrating. 
Imagine that. Yeah. Like, I am sure. Yeah, I am. You weren't there. That's you don't, fucked. It, it just feels like, oh, I, yeah, I just can't get my head around that. Um, how you think that that is an appropriate thing to do. Yeah. So this was a constant thing throughout. People just didn't believe Bundy could have committed the crimes because he wasn't what they thought a murderer would look like or how a murderer would behave. Well, yeah, that's how he's gotten away with it for so long and that's how he's lured people to come and help him because he looks like a normal, nice young guy. According to a report in the New York Times from the 70s, from the beginning there was a basic contradiction in the strange case of Ted Bundy. The moment he stepped into the courtroom in Utah to answer a charge of kidnapping, those who saw him for the first time agreed with those who had known him for all of his 28 years. There must have been some terrible mistake. He was a young man who represented the best in America, not the worst. He was this terrific-looking man with light brown hair and blue eyes looking rather Kennedy-esque, dressed in a beige turtleneck and a dark blue blazer. He's wearing a beige. Smile. He's wearing beige. He's wearing beige. <laughs> the best Serial in color. Killer. The best in color we have. <laughs> Maybe this is why no one ever noticed him because he was just a, he was wearing beige, beige. he was driving tan or blue. <laughs> Doesn't this just sound like absolute nonsense to you? Well, he was the best in America. He had light brown hair and blue oh. eyes. What the fuck are you talking <laughs> they have that about? that strange American exceptionalism where they're just like, we're the best. I don't, but what, I mean, yep. light brown hair, could it be any more boring than that? <laughs> He's the best of America. He had light brown hair, blue eyes. Okay. You know, one of the, one of the three or four types of eye colour you can have. <laughs> Who gives a shit? Uh, that's my fiery redhead anger coming out there. <laughs> yeah, but you got those beautiful blue oh, eyes. so beautiful. I do have the blue eyes. I'm, I'm part of that. And to be honest, my hair has really faded to a light brown. Yeah, and I'm not offended. Mine's more of like an ashy, darker brown. <laughs> and I've got green eyes. So I know you're not criticising me. I'm interesting. I just, I, I just, keep, you just keep reading about it. You're like, what you're saying is nothing. It's not anything. Mm. I mean, looking Kennedy-esque and, and having the, you know, the confidence to wear a turtleneck with a blazer. Yeah. I mean. He, he rocked up to court at another point with a big bow tie. It's just a, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> and they talk about it. He had a smile turning the corners of his lean all-American face, walking almost jauntily before the judge, but free of any extravagant motion that could lead to lead one to think, a swaggering, even dangerous personality existed beneath that casual, cool exterior. So the media just had a massive boner for him for some reason. <laughs> They're talking about him like he's the front man of like a really cool band. Yeah. Yeah, and then you see video of, of the these court, like because some of the times he was in court was fully filmed and televised and you're like, I, I don't know, it just seems like a, just seems like a normal, I guess that's the point, right? He just seems like a... But he just doesn't seem, I don't get why they keep talking about him like he's fully exceptional and all this sort of stuff. Mm. But whatever. Different time. Uh, luckily, the evidence presented in this case proved otherwise, though. So, I mean, the way that article is like, who could possibly think it? Well, luckily, the judge did. <laughs> <laughs> the judge was not attracted to him. Yeah. The judge is like, you're wearing beige. You're clearly a murderer. <laughs> And ha having Doronch's eyewitness testimony was also very helpful. And yeah. she, they really grilled her, the defence team, and she uh, tried to trip her up and all that, those classic things. And apparently she did uh, really well. And Bundy was found guilty of kidnapping and assault of Doronch and was sentenced to a minimum of one year. This is kind of a strange sentence, but apparently it was one that was done back there in Utah. Minimum of a one year, maximum of 15 years in Utah State Prison. It's really given them options, I guess, to see how they go inside. Um, around this time, the different states started working together a bit more closely with representatives from Washington, Utah and Colorado all meeting in Aspen to, comp uh, to compare notes. Then in October, Bundy was charged with the murder of Karen Campbell in Colorado. As well as the ski resort pamphlet the police found, the Colorado police also found evidence that could place him within a few miles of Karen Campbell the night she disappeared as well as a witness who came forward saying that they'd seen him in the elevator on the very day that she went missing. Wow. He didn't fight extradition. He had the option to, but he didn't fight extradition uh, to be sent to Colorado from Utah. And uh, so he was sent to Aspen in January 1977 to stand trial for first-degree murder. 
and there he would be facing the death penalty. Wow. Uh, Despite his limited time in law school and his relatively poor marks, Bundy rated himself as a lawyer. He spent his time behind bars working on his defence, and that's what it seemed like he was spending all his time doing. But he was also, unbeknownst to anyone else, also working on his escape. His plan was to escape from the Pitkin County Courthouse prior to a preliminary hearing. He later recalled, quote, I psyched, psyched, psyched myself up for weeks, and literally, it took two weeks. <laughs> I began jumping off the top bunk in my cell in the Garfield County Jail, jumping again and again off the top bunk to, to the floor to strengthen my legs for the impact. Oh, nightmare bunk, mate. Oh, my God. Just go to sleep. The other guy in the cell is like, fucking hell, we're in jail. Could this get any worse? Oh, yeah. And actually, the top bunk is my bed. Yeah. Stop climbing up and jumping <laughs> off it. I'm sleeping. There's no room up here, okay? Uh, he went on. I measured, mentally measured the distance from the corner of the courthouse to the alley and from the alley to the riverbed and from the riverbed to the mountains. And I measured my cell and I ran those distances. I ran those distances again and again. I practiced how rapidly I could change my clothes from my courtroom attire to my shorts. And I got a haircut so that I had a different appearance. Finally, I stood right before it. I hesitated. You cannot believe the thoughts that flipped through my mind. I could be free. The windows were open and the fresh air is blowing through and the sky was blue. And I said, I'm ready to go. And I walked to the window and I jumped out. Wow. June 7th, 1977, he jumped from the second floor window with a 25-foot drop to the ground, and before anyone realised what had happened, he was gone. That's a huge drop. Yeah. So, yeah, it was funny because I, I didn't know any of this stuff. No. Uh, watching the doco. So I I heard him say all that stuff, and at the end I was like, wait, what? He, es- he escaped. He escaped jail. I had no idea. Apparently this is all, I mean, this is all the famous parts of the story, but... Uh, I assume if I don't know, probably a bunch of our listeners don't know either. And I'm like, what the fuck? His defense attorney, Charles Leidner, recalled, there was nobody looking after him. He wasn't shackled. He wasn't chained. He wasn't handcuffed. They didn't have a waist chain on him and they kind of let him roam freely throughout the courtroom. It was inconceivable to me that you would have somebody accused of first degree murder who by that time was thought to be involved in a series of murders throughout the West and that your security level would be so low. Because he was sort of representing himself. He had access to the law library. Right. And the courthouse library. So he was in the courthouse library. That's where he jumped from. Okay. And the guy, the security guard who was meant to be watching him went out for a smoke. Oh, now I vaguely remember this, actually. And then he came back and he's like, Where the, where's he gone? Yeah. And it, apparently it was about 10 minutes before anyone realised. And someone's like, I thought I saw someone jump from the window. And by that stage, he was gone. Roadblocks were set up on the two roads in and out of town, and every car was searched on its way through. The sheriff's department had 150 officers and five bloodhounds searching for him, and Leidner recalled, his uh, defence attorney, people were showing up on horseback with bandoleros strung across their chest with rifles, probably half lit, ready to go out and hunt Bundy. But days went by without a sighting. He'd vanished without a trace. But then, nearly seven days after the escape, Bundy was back in custody. He had hiked up up the mountain, found a cabin to rest in, but the weather took its toll and he decided to walk back into Aspen. Once there, he stole a car and an officer noted him driving erratically and pulled him over. It took him a moment to realise he'd found one of America's most wanted (laughs) as Bundy had again altered his appearance with glasses and a seven-day growth. He had also lost about 25 pounds due to lack of food. He really, he just... Didn't do so well in the outdoors. In seven um, days. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I don't know what 25 pounds is, but it's it's quite a bit, I think. Yeah. Leidner recalled what Bundy talked about once he was back behind bars. He talked about how lucky the people were to catch him and how stupid the people were who caught him and how intellectually superior he was to everybody. And I thought to myself, those things may be true, but you're the one in jail and those are the ones who are on the outside. <laughs> That's his own defence lawyers like, all right, mate. Yeah, he's just got a lot of self-belief, old Bundy. Wow. But again, just a bit of luck. Like a random a cop goes, oh, he's driving a bit funny. Yeah. If he didn't drive funny, he wouldn't have been caught the two times he's been caught. 
Yeah, mate, just put, have your headlights on and don't drive like an idiot. And looking a bit dim, he's put on some glasses. That's not going to do it. 25 pounds is about 11 kilos. Wow, that is that's in, a that's huge amount of weight to lose so in a So unhealthy. Mm. That's And he's terrible. already quite a, a little guy. Like he's quite a Yeah, skinny he's a slim man guy, anyway. yeah. Far out. The escape led to additional charges, including four felony charges, two counts of felonious escape, and one count each of burglary and auto theft because of the car he stole, and a misdemeanor count of theft. If found guilty of these new charges alone, Bundy faced 90 years in prison and $130,000 in fines. Incredibly, though, this wasn't Bundy's only attempt at a jailbreak. According to ABC News, Bundy was then moved to the Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. In his cell was a grate that was not secured. There was also a light fixture that was due to be welded but had not yet been uh, by the time Bundy was behind bars. In the months he spent at the jail, Bundy began losing weight again. Uh, Bundy carved an opening that was in the ceiling of his cell wider than it was so that he could fit through, and he arranged some law books and pillows to make it look like there was a body in his bed. So he crawled through the ducting, and he came down to one of the jailer's apartments, who wasn't there, put on civilian clothes, and escaped into the night. What? (laughs) Oh, my God. So... You've got a guy who's accused of killing multiple people. He's already escaped and you put him in the cell with the grate that's unsecured and the hole in the roof and you're like, we'll weld that shut later. Yeah. What? The- Out of all incredible? the cells you've got there, he's the one you don't put in there, right? He's escaped before yeah. and he's probably killed. Yeah. So it seems like the first escape, luckily, uh, he didn't kill while it was out. This time... Not so lucky. So there's that mistake ended in multiple more people dying. Um, the following morn- morning, a jailer noticed he hadn't eaten his meal. So then he checked his bed and he found the books and pillows. But by then he was long gone. It was the next day. And sadly, he was out killing again almost instantly. What the fuck? And each time it seems to be, it seems to ramp up. It's quicker. It's, he kills more people. Uh, in less amounts of time. So for a second time, Bundy had managed to escape from police custody in Colorado. After leaving the jail, he boarded a flight to Chicago, then took a train to Ann Arbor in Michigan, then drove south to Atlanta and got on a bus to Tallahassee in Florida. So he, he did all that to just, I guess, get people off the scent. While that he, um, like, one of the most wanted men in America could catch so many different yeah. modes of transport. But I guess, again, it's just that face. Yeah. He's also lost weight, so he's probably changed his appearance again. Uh, he's probably parted his hair in a different <laughs> way once again. Changes your face big time, let me tell you. Uh, he was then added to the list of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. It was in Florida where Bundy killed his final known victims. Margaret Bowman, 21, Lisa Levy, 20, and Kimberly Leach, 12. Oh, fucking hell. And they were, all, were they all in a very short period of time? Uh, so Bowman and Levy were members of the Key Omega sorority house uh, at a university there in Florida, mm. in Tallahassee. And those attacks happened within 15 minutes of each other, as well as two more brutal attacks in the same building. So four attacks in a space of 15 minutes. Fuck. But then he he left and broke into another apartment of another student on uh, uh, like soon after Cheryl Thomas said her apartment and left her with lasting injuries as well. So five attacks in the same night, um, three survivors, but all had lasting injuries. That's horrendous. Yes. Um, you know, and there's so many bedrooms next to each other. Just so fucking brazen. So it just like I don't know. It's just all all ramped up and up. Um, he was living just around the corner, so you assume he sort of sussed it all out again. Yeah. Finally, on Feb fifteenth, nineteen seventy eight, Bundy was r- arrested again. So he was out on the run for about a, a month and a half. And how um, how did they find him? Well. Would you believe? Oh, no, he got back this is according in the car. to the ABC. Yeah, 
At 1.30am, an officer noticed a car loitering suspiciously. The officer ran the plates and discovered the orange Volkswagen was stolen. After a scuffle, Bundy was arrested but refused to identify himself. Once in custody, Bundy told officials he was an FSU student named Kenneth and gave them a stolen driver's license. So a third time, three times he was arrested all because of driving erratically. Mm. And it sounds like, I, I saw it somewhere else he was driving a different car. So there's a couple of times where it's a bit inconsistent there. But if that's the case, did he steal his trademark Another car? Another Volkswagen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's orange this time though. It's a bit more interesting. Yeah. Wow. Um, so he's he's out saying he's this guy, Kenneth. Uh, and that made the, some local news and word got to the real Kenneth Meisner of Tallahassee and he got in touch to say, nah, that's not me. you got a different guy. But they had no idea who. Fuck. They had one of the 10 most wanted men in America and they had no idea. He had this weird sort of uh, wide moustache and he looked like the photos from when he was arrested this time, he looks different, completely different. And he refused to talk for a few days. They were trying to, his lawyer was trying to get him out on bail. And the prosecution's like, or the the state or whatever is like, he's not even admitting to who he is. How do we get him out on bail? You talk about a flight risk. Mm. We don't even know who he is. And it was, it was wild that the, anyway, I guess that's, he was doing his job, but you're like, uh, yeah, I don't think they can let him out. Um, it took two days before he cracked. He was feeling very lonely, he wanted to talk to someone who wasn't a lawyer or a police officer, and he uh, made a deal. He let him know who he was in exchange for a phone call with his girlfriend, Clofer. According to All That's Interesting, when he called Clofer, he was in tears, and according to her mem- memoir that was written much later, he was desperate to take responsibility for his actions. That's what he told her. Now in custody, it had to be decided which state would get to try him first. It was decided he would be tried first in Florida, in part, and I think this is good logic, because they had a more secure jail. <laughs> okay. And it feels like that had to be front of mind. None of like, the available cells needed, like, bars replaced or something, like, yeah. you know? They didn't have big they gaping thought about holes. That. They had one, but, yeah, they realised that um, it had you know, no free door. range jail wasn't... <laughs> Probably going to do it. So can I ask, what was the, was there like a penny drop moment when he was like, it's I, Ted Bundy, and they're all like, oh, my fucking <gasps> God. Or are they like, who's that? Well, I think some would say, oh, we was, we were suspecting it. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. Uh, he stood trial for the Florida murders, the, the most recent ones, the ones from the sorority. Yeah. Uh, in June 1979. It was the first trial to be broadcast on national television and received massive media coverage. So this is more of the people going, oh, this guy, he couldn't be this guy. Look at the way he talks. He's joking around with the judge. He's killed people in multiple states, for God's sake. Yeah. yeah. Um, But he did have blue eyes. (laughs) Uh, Despite the advice of his lawyers, Bundy basically represented himself. I mean, the others did some work as well, and then he got angry at them for, for probably doing a good job. That's not how I would have done it. Um, and he did about as good of a job as you'd expect someone who'd done a small fraction of a law degree and not particularly well. Mm-hmm. He did he did shit out, I think. <laughs> um, he rejected a deal that would have spared his life if he was willing to plead guilty, but he pled not guilty. So, so much for wanting to take responsibility. What a that fucking he was idiot. Tearfully telling Clofer just before, yeah. I want to take responsibility. Are you guilty? Nah, not guilty. Mm. He cross-examined witnesses, getting them to describe the crime scenes in graphic detail. And the other lawyers like, no, that is something you should not do. Why are you bringing up that stuff? But it was almost like he was reveling in it, you know, hearing about it. Mm. Um, he made other tactical blunders along the way. A key Omega sorority member named Nita Neary was able to describe a man she saw leaving the crime scene. According to all that's interesting, she was able to give a good, strong description, said lead prosecutor Larry Simpson. Nita Neary did meet with an artist and drew a sketch of the person that she saw leaving the Key Omega house. It looked like Mr. Bundy. It wasn't merely a passing similarity based on eyewitness reports that swayed the trial in the prosecution's favour, though. 
Bundy's hair match fibers found in a pantyhose mask, for instance. And, and there was also an infamous bite mark left on Lisa Levy. And that was a uh, strong evidence against the killer. The prosecution was able to get an expert to match Bundy's teeth to the bite mark. Uh, apparently this kind of evidence isn't used anymore as it's not seen as reliable, but it was one of the key things that uh, took him down in that case. Wow. If the teeth fit. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like, yeah, it's like that. You must not acquit. <laughs> Despite the seriousness of his charges, Judge Edward Cowart remained chummy with Bundy throughout the proceedings. What? Yuck. Yuck. On the 24th of July, 1979, the jury deliberated for around six hours before finding him guilty of two counts of murder, three counts of attempted first-degree murder, and two counts of burglary. Judge Edward Cowart sentenced Bundy to death, but in a bizarre end of the bizarre trial, Ugh. Judge Cowart said to Bundy after sen- sentencing him to the electric later? chair, <laughs> honestly, it's even grosser than that. That's what he says. To Bundy about Bundy. As he's just gone, hey, so yeah, those heinous murders you've just been found guilty of, you're going to the chair. It's such a tragedy to see a total waste, I think, of humanity that I've experienced in this court. You'd think he's talking about the victims right. of this yeah, yeah. It's not. You're a bright young man. You'd have made a good lawyer. I'd have loved to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. Take care of yourself. I don't have any animosity to you. I want what you to know fuck? that. What the fuck? This is all on video. This is all in the Netflix uh, doco. You're going, wait, what he, the fuck oh, is going on I remember that here? now, yeah. What? That's gross. Are you allowed to, as a judge to do that? Such a shame. You would have been such a great lawyer. You're such a nice man with blue eyes. It's just uh, I can't even really fully believe that you've murdered countless women, um, all very young, who had futures ahead of them. But, um, God, the real shame here is that you don't... <laughs> Get to be a lawyer. Oh, what a tragedy. Yuck. Yeah, I couldn't, be- I couldn't believe it. I forgot about um, that. Yeah, that's fucked. Is that, uh, do people famously talk about how fucked that is? Uh, it was mentioned a few times, but, I mean, maybe it was just the way, I was going to say maybe it was just the way the documentary portrayed it, but, I mean, however you portray that, you, that's going to stand out to you, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Bundy then stood trial again for the murder of the 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. There was strong witness testimony as well as other evidence linking him to the crime, including fibres and hotel receipts. And on the 10th of February 1980, the jury found him guilty and he was again sentenced to death. Double death. According to Inside Edition, during his trial, Bundy took advantage of a... This is pretty bizarre. Bundy took advantage of a Florida law that allows any couple that declares they're married in court in front of a judge to be considered legally wed. While questioning... I don't know if you recall his his girlfriend who's sort of been seeing for quite a long time, Carol Ann Boone. Mm-hmm. While she was being questioned there, she was standing by him through the whole thing. She was um, sure he was innocent. She testified on his behalf at both trials. Uh, when she was on the stand at one point, Bundy asked her to marry him. She accepted and they, would, and they declared to the court they were legally wed. Boone gave birth to a baby girl in October 1982 and named Bundy the father. Did they also have sex in the courtroom? <laughs> no, but apparently conjugal visits weren't allowed, um, but they basically just bribed the guards and they the guards oh. turned a blind eye. So apparently even they walk in on them sometimes. Um, she would also smuggle uh, drugs in for him inside of her and then they'd meet and he'd put him inside of him and then go to his cell and smoke marijuana stuff. So... Yeah, he he had a kid when he was after he was found guilty. Whoa! I did read. I think Anne Rule said that um, his daughter grew up to be a real smart, intelligent person. Obviously, she's gone way off the radar to escape all of this. Yeah, you wouldn't be, so, still be using the name Bundy. I, I no. would assume. And I I know the internet's a dark. Pl- I just I didn't even want to look into it. I'm like, what a fucking rough start to your life. I I just hope she's okay. In 1980, journalist Stephen McCowd, McCowd, apologies for the pronunciation of your name, Stephen, he was the one I've been talking about. Uh, He started interviewing Bundy on death row, went in with a tape recorder, uh, and he was promised by Bundy that he'd get the real story. 
but he found Bundy to be a slippery interviewee, much preferring to talk about a rose-coloured version of his childhood where he was popular with all the kids and he loved playing sports and all these things that others just say that is not how it was at all. So it's just like he was, it was almost like he was doing a PR thing. He wanted to do a celebrity bio of himself and that's what he wanted published. But um, yeah, which really frustrated McCowd. He's like, I, I want him to tell the stories. And then he had, McCowd had this idea. He's like, I've just got to get him to talk in the third person. So he goes, you, you're a psychology um, student. You must you must have some ideas about the kind of person who would have committed these crimes. And then apparently Bundy grabbed the tape recorder, cradled it and just went off and talked about a lot of the stuff in detail of how, basically how he would have done it, but, you know, or how the person would have done right. it and what would have been going through their mind and that sort of stuff. But he never admitted to it. He never said, I did it. He was always talking. The so he did person. a bit of an if I did it. Yeah, it was a, an OJ Simpson type mm. thing. Um, by the time he was done interviewing Bundy, he was really over it saying, I was really interested in putting Ted in my rear view mirror. We'd recorded roughly a hundred hours of recorded conversation, but if you listen to the tapes, he never confessed. The last time I talked to Ted, we said we were going to publish the book. He said, I don't care what you say, as long as it sells. I was heartily sick of what I was hearing. I was sick of Ted. I walked out of that prison with an enormous sense of relief. Him and his partner, his mentor, both said it, it kind of ruined their lives in a lot of ways. They just feel the Bundy shadow hanging over them and they, you know, they, it's just sort of sounds like it's kind of sort of tainted their brains a bit. Right, like their most famous achievement is this horrific thing talking to him about it. Oh, well, I well, I read it like more like just spending that much time with him, hearing him talk and what uh, he believed. It's just like it actually just like makes you think about everything differently and he apparently Bundy said to him at one point he's like you would you'd make a great serial killer and he's like I don't want to hear that mate yeah I'm just trying to be a journalist trying to get the story this is again from uh inside edition after his appeals were exhausted Bundy told Robert Keppel who I haven't mentioned but he was also one of the the big investigators he's quite a famous investigator from this case um so Bundy told Keppel that he killed the eight women who went missing in Washington and Oregon. It, it started to look like he was going to be get the chair without ever admitting to it, but it was almost like a tactic. He thought he might be able to delay them further. He said he started admitting to some of them. He said, I can give you more information if you need more time. This is like a day before or two days before he was, he was due to get the electric chair. Um, so he admitted he killed the eight women who went missing in Washington and Oregon. He confessed to three more murders in Washington and two in Oregon, but declined to provide their names, so they're still unknown. He also told Keppel he returned to the scene of Hawkins' disappearance as the investigation was underway in Washington. There he located earrings and a shoe belonging to Hawkins and left without being seen. Keppel wrote, it was a feat so brazen that it astonishes police even today. In total, Bundy confessed to 30 murders in seven states between 1974 and 1978. He spoke vaguely of the remains he buried in a bid for more time before his execution, but ultimately all the families of his victims refused to sign off on such a plan. We're not going to be we're not going to have the system manipulated, Florida Governor Bob Martinez said. For him to be negotiating for his life over the bodies of victims is despicable. The bodies of Wilcox, Kent, Cunningham, Culver, Curtis and Oliverson were never recovered. Authorities believe he was responsible for, for at least six more homicides than he had confessed to and say the number could be significantly higher, noting that advances in technology may tie him to additional cases. Keppel and Rule both believe Bundy may have begun killing when he was a teen. Uh, Bundy was put to death for the murder of Kimberly Diane Leach on January the 24th, 1989. So you two never overlapped with his fuckhead on this earth, which is kind of nice. Um, he was electrocuted at 7.06 p.m. and pronounced dead at 7.16 p.m. That day, hundreds gathered across uh, from the prison to applaud his death. People sang, danced and cheered as his body was transported from the prison. Wow. It was actually like seeing footage of it. It was really gross. It was like they were at a, uh, like a you know a festival yeah. or something. It was, 
It was really strange. Yeah, it feels really gross. Yeah. Uh, onlookers wore shirts that read burn, Bundy burn, oh. and others helped uh, held up miniature nooses. At one point, fireworks were fired into the air. Oh, my God. So it, it had a real, like, sick festival atmosphere about it. This, I almost, I wasn't going to put this detail in because it kind of, I, I kind of hate it, but he requested that his ashes be scattered uh, in a specific mountain and that they did that, even though that is where a lot of the bodies were found. I'm like, why? Oh, God. Why did they allow him to get his final wish and people who, like the victims' families, have to sort of have that in their mind? It sucks. Oh, I should have flushed him down the toilet. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that was <laughs> the story of Ted wow. Bundy. So I can understand what you were saying before about the uh, journalists f- felt like being in it for that many hours and yeah. weeks and months and years really takes its toll because whenever we do a report like this, we're only looking to it for about a week and we're reading obviously secondary sources and stuff like that. But mm. it still weighs on your mind a lot, doesn't it, Matt? Yeah, it, does. it really does. Um, and, yeah, I mean... we. I think individually we do them very rarely. I, this is maybe the second or third one I've done about us here. I did one about Jack the Ripper. Mm-hmm. And, I, yeah, maybe that's the only... And some other mysteries like the Black, Black Dahlia mystery. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think this one maybe maybe made me feel weirder than all the others. Just no good. But it was also very fascinating, of course, and I know why people are interested in this sort of stuff. Yeah. The... Netflix documentary got real mixed reviews, but I I um, found it quite fascinating, mainly because I didn't know the story at all, I guess. Yeah. And it was the, that was the first I was hearing of the story. So I watched that before I started reading. And, um, yeah. Uh, there, I mean, Zac Efron played him in a film last year as well. And there's been heaps of movies made about him, so a good half dozen or more actors have played him. So imagine they really would have had to have gotten into his mind. Yeah. I watched the Zac Efron one and I can't remember it. So I don't know if that means it's good. Oh, interesting. <laughs> or bad. It was, so, it, you know, Clo- Clofer, mm-hmm. his long-term girlfriend, who was one of the ones who really helped him get caught. That was Lily Collins, on, wasn't it? Who played her. I think oh. so. Anyway, yep. Yeah. yeah, so that was um, that film in particular was based on her, yeah. from her point of view, apparently, but I haven't seen it. Yep. Um, yeah, so anyway, block. That's what we got one left to go. So there's only one topic that had more votes than Ted Bundy. Than Ted Can you Bundy. believe we'll it? Find out what that was next week. And I can't quite remember what it was, Me but either. I do remember that Dave is doing it next week. I am reporting on it. So it's okay. I know what it is. So maybe my question next week oh, can be a bit God. more <laughs> open because yeah. you guys probably, honestly, I think I brought, uh, when it came up, you guys said you actually hadn't heard of. The topic. So, oh, okay, cool. I wonder if it's American again. Get a clean sweep. It might be, and maybe North Carolina will get that fifth and final mention. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find a way. We'll find a way to get it in there. Um, so, yeah, thanks to everyone who suggested, everyone who voted, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I know, I, I know people, um, I do recall last time I did a topic like this, a few people messaged me asking if I was okay. I'm fine. Please do. <laughs> I, pre- I do appreciate um, those thoughts, but, you know, this is, it's all it's all part of it. I, they can't always be stories about my favourite Sydney punk band. Or, no, that's yeah. right. I, even last I week we did like a comedy hero, Robin Williams, and of course that ended in tragedy as well. So it's, yeah. it's yeah. hard. But, you know, we do we do all sorts of stories and I think that's that's part of what this makes this podcast interesting is it could be, the topic could be anything and it, they genuinely, I've felt every possible emotion in, um, recording this podcast. Isn't that what life's all about? Yeah. yeah. It's about feeling stuff. It's about feelings and feelings said feelings. It's good. Okay. Well, that brings us to everyone's favourite part of the show, the fact quote or question section. And in this section, uh, you can get involved if you go to patreon.com slash pod and you sign up to the Sydney Scheinberg Deluxe Memorial Rest in Peace Edition level. And once on there, you'll get instructions to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. And this week, we have four more fantastic fact Look, quote questions. Matt, I'm going to have to pull you up on something there. Does this section have a <laughs> theme song? Is that true? I've heard that. I th- I actually, I think this might have a bit of a theme song. I think it goes a little something. 
Like facts, quote or question. He always remembers the ding. Oh, that's funny. I, f- I forgot all about that. I should say I was up till um, 5 a.m. this morning uh, writing this report. So I'm a little that's tired. Right. Similar to- Do you know how you could avoid that? Um, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Have you thought about that, man? Be honest. Go to bed. I could, I, I could just, get, yeah, I could probably, yeah, write a shorter report. It's interesting. This report was probably, it was longer than the OJ Simpson one. But I think in this episode might go around the same amount of time. But yeah, I both were those reports. I mean, I could have just left out some details. Yeah, just leave shit out. But the tricky thing is, it feels like, I mean, it feels like if anything, I should have put way more details in, but then this would become a like a hardcore history podcast that goes for 18 hours Exactly, or yeah. Am I saying that right, Dave? Hardcore history? Yeah, great show, great show. Dan Carlin, what a guy. Great. Uh, okay, so sorry that I forgot that the jingle goes there. But the first fact, quote, or question out of this week is from, and I should say this about all of them, but from great friend of the show, Nathan Damon, whose title he's given himself is Sir Nathalot of Do Go On Land. Ooh. Hello. Fancy. Fancy. His fact is, uh, okay, let's see when this is dated because, uh, 16, yeah, this is before AFL finals. His fact is West Coast Eagles are the best club in the AFL. I know Matt doesn't read these before he reads them, so he had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well played there, Nathan, but... Uh, just as I checked the date, it was uh, before finals uh, in which the Eagles were eliminated in week one. The Saints <laughs> survived all the way to week two. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty good. Of four. I mean, of four weeks, we made the final six. That's something. It's not bad. Uh, I think around the time that he wrote that message, the Eagles had just beaten us. But uh, who had the last laugh? <laughs> Neither of us. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Nathan, for that. Very good fact. I do. I mean, he makes me like the Eagles more. Um, but they're one of those teams that have been not around for not that long and have won four premierships. Unfair. Okay. Saints have been around since 1873, have won one premiership. The Eagles have only existed since 1987, I think, or 86 oh, wow. or 85 or something, and they've won four. So Have you guys thought about playing better? <laughs> oh, what we're, about we're getting to... better players? Yeah, I think we're starting to do some of those things. Have you thought it's about having, having some food before a game? Maybe be hungry. Uh, or maybe they've eaten to- too much food. Oh, and got a stitch. yeah, you've got, to get the right, you've got to get the right amount of food. <laughs> uh, the next one comes from Stefan Headley, a very good friend of the show, who has given themselves the title of president of procrastinating at work. Oh, wow. Wow. I think, I think I might work in your division. Yeah, my leash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, does he stay up till 5 a.m. the day before? <laughs> Or the day of, (laughs) something's due, a report, for example. I mean, that's not just procrastination. I feel like I'm Sally's no more gaps when I'm writing a (laughs) a report. No matter how much space I leave myself, I'll fill it. Yeah. Uh, Stefan writes another, he's got a fact as well. A a 150,000 pound diamond was destroyed in an F1 Grand Prix. Well, this is interesting. Jag, I love these. They're almost mini reports, these ones. Jaguar team... Hang on. Jaguar team up with the film released of Ocean 12 and put two diamonds on the nose of each car at the Monaro race. In lap one, Christian uh, Klein crashed out and the diamond was never found, clearly destroyed in the accident. Or... Oh, how interesting. That feels like that's just a beautiful tie-in news story for a heist. Totally, you're right. They made him crash. He crashed on purpose. They made him crash. It was always going to go missing. Maybe. I don't know, but that's cool. I never heard of that. Great fact. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, the next one comes from a very good friend of the show, Manny Garza, who's given himself the title Junior Janitor of the Matt Stewart Pun Factory. <laughs> oh, it's a ghost town in there. No one even knows what we're making. <laughs> <laughs> we're all standing on the conveyor place? belts going, is this, <laughs> is this, is this anything? <laughs> and it's just like a... A small plaster mold of a hand. Is this a pun? Is this a pun? I don't know. And then the next thing is just like a little jar of lollies. Is this a pun? <laughs> I don't know how pun? there's so many different things on this conveyor, but it's very confusing. Uh, so Manny has a question. I'm trying to be more positive and have decided to rope you all into it as well. Hey, that's cool, Manny. Me too. That's great. 
What's one thing you all genuinely love about one another individually and yourselves? Oh, my God. Just compliment each other. That's cute. It's a beautiful question. Uh, I'm sure we've done this before. I love, I think, Jess, I mean, you, you got so many great qualities. So many. Uh, too, almost too many to list. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> no, Jess, I think. Uh, Moving on. <laughs> Uh, no, I just love, I love how you're, you've just, you've got the clearest mind. You can see things. You've got such great perspective for such a young person. <laughs> you can, you see the world and you, you know, um, you know what you want and that sort of stuff. And I think it's real cool. And yeah, obviously you're just great fun to hang out with and you're very uh, fun and funny. Very great, very fun stand up comic when you do that, which no one does anymore. <laughs> Not now, world. Okay. Uh, Dave, <laughs> is this awkward to listen to? It feels weird. Yeah, Dave, mm. uh, that hair hat has gone from strength it's to strength. It's gone too big. You started at the big, bottom, now you're thank here. thank you. No, your hair's sick. Love your hair. Uh, I love how you are just so, your temperament is so even. Mm. You just never, you're pretty unflappable and I feel like you're never a sarcastic asshole. I can't help but do it. It's a, like one of my worst habits. And you never do it. You're always just a cool guy. You're just a cool guy always. Thank you. I think it's very cool. I do I honestly I when I when I'm a bit of a smart ass or something, I think be more like Dave. <laughs> and when I'm stressing over a decision or something, I'm like, what would Jess do? <laughs> I think about you you guy, you've got superpowers that I wish I had. I mean, they're pretty low-key superpowers, admittedly. <laughs> it's not flying or laser beams, but still. Still pretty good. All right, uh, thank no, you. You've got to say hey. something you like about yourself. Yeah. Oh fuck. I was gonna. I was gonna request if you two could not do me, um, or at least do joke ones, because that's been too much. Um... I know it feels wrong. Well, it feels weird to have like to to be pushed to have this conversation. Obviously, we're yeah. usually quite nice with each other anyway, um, for the most part. So we might say these things to each other in conversation or in a in a message, not so much on the podcast. Because we've been asked. I don't to. think Matt's ever called me a cool guy before, so I appreciate being you being forced to say that. Ah, you're a, you're a super cool guy, big fan, great fashion. I mean, both of you, I love love just everything about. I can't think of a bad thing. <laughs> uh, about myself, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, yeah, it's pretty hard. I know Dave has said to me before that my stubbornness can be good, and I Fantastic. think that is true. I think that helps me in certain. Uh, certain ways, I'll stick things out. Generally speaking, yeah, that's true. You definitely do that, and I, I think I always admire that because I give up on things quite easily, but you always stick at things. You're very goal oriented, so you, yeah, yeah, you really stick at things, which is great. For the most part, if I if I give myself a goal, I'll stick to it. For the most part, yeah. Um, something that applies for both of you is that I'm always, even after doing a podcast with you for nearly five years, is that your humor and how fast you are is it still catches me off guard. I think most of what I'm laughing at is how did you get to that joke so quickly? Um, you're both very, very sharp. And, yeah, same same as what Matt said for Dave, you are the same always and that's a good thing. Like you're, you're totally unflappable because I think Matt and I are probably more similar to each other um, and then you're just kind of this very steady constant and it's, it's needed. We need that and it's awesome. Yeah, especially in touring. So handy. Yeah. One of Jess or I will be up or down. <laughs> if we're both up, oh, my God, oh, so what good. A great if day we're in both the car. down, it's a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> I think our, our ups and our downs look different, but they're, they're basically the same, right? <laughs> yeah, essentially. We're anxious. <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think our downs are both just leave us alone if that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Still polite, hopefully. Yeah. It's still, if you don't mind, could I just be alone for a bit? I like you ended up having a code, didn't you? He's like, uh, oh, red zone. Oh, yes, red zone. <laughs> I haven't had coffee. Yeah, Leave me alone. The morning red zone. Don't fuck with me. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, that felt gross. My, my turn here. Jess, you're amazing, first of all. Um, I will put down your kindness and unmatched emotional intelligence. Mm. Incredible stuff. Our match, biggest in the honestly, world. Honestly, yeah. of everyone, anyone I've ever met, honestly. So <laughs> not just on the pod, nice. but honestly, yeah. You can go to you with something and you always sort of see it from other people's perspectives and be really kind and, yeah. And you, 
And even with just like generic problems, like with people, I feel like you could do an advice show because often you'll predict how people are feeling. If you could, but maybe they're thinking this, and I'll be like, oh yeah, okay, yeah. maybe that that's right. So that's for that. And Matt, uh, your unbridled enthusiasm for things that you get headlong into—it's just like it's amazing. Like for for music or TV shows and just, just stuff. It's I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, Matt, you've stuff. got a really good brain for also like I I love music, but I don't remember or have the same retention. I'm always amazed at your retention for information, especially around music. It's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Not do go on topics. God, no, I don't remember any of that. But who would? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of psycho would? Anyway, that's enough. Um, yes, enough thank nice you. We're all very it? nice to each other. Yes, we love each thanks, other. Manny. Thanks, Manny. That's very nice. And good thanks, on you for, Manny, for that trying to be more positive. Moment. That's yes. <laughs> hey, Manny, if I could say something about you, I love your abilities. Uh, you know the ones I'm talking about. You know those ones. Thank you so much for that. Manny, apologies for anyone cringing with all of their body. Um, <laughs> Unclench your butt. <laughs> yeah. and your sh- Full body clench. And then just drop your shoulders. It's okay. It's time to release. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, this one comes from um, M-A-E-N. I'm going to say Maine. Maine. Maine Gallagher. That's a fantastic name. Maine. I love it, however it's pronounced. Hopefully that is pretty close. Hmm. Maine. Uh Who's given themselves the title of theme hospital administrator and roller coaster tycoon? Oh, bit of a gamer, bit of a classic gamer. That's a really fun game. And this one comes with a disclaimer: this is dumb as shit, but somehow it became our favourite hypothetical at uni. So I thought I'd ask you guys. Okay. So it's a question: Would you rather reign over cats and dogs or reinvent the veal? <laughs> oh. What? I'd, what? Uh, important question clarification. Okay, great. Cats and dogs don't understand monarchy or how you <laughs> ran over them. <laughs> okay. But your feline canine authority is recognised by the UN. I think personally I'm going to reinvent the veal because I, I don't know heaps about it, but I'm pretty sure it's like a famously cruel meat where they take a baby cow away from the mother and then put it in like a small darkened room and then for for a while kind of torture it and then kill it and that's how they get veal to be veal so i'm going to reinvent the veal and i'm going to make it banana oh. <laughs> yeah great how good's banana i don't know how if that'll go as well <laughs> with you know like your three veg on the side but <laughs> we you figure out we didn't way. have a simpsons reference on this episode this week to my knowledge so just no, you made did one. Did I? You did make one. Yeah, what was it? See? It was, you never explained it, but you did make they're one. They're just second nature to you now, Dave. You don't even realise you're doing them. Well, just in case to get one in there, I love um, when on The Simpsons they're, I think it's Itchy and Scratchy Land and they're ordering like disgusting sounding food mm-hmm. and then Marge is shocked at first but then she realises, she's like, oh, okay, and she goes, I'll just have the baby guts and they all go, Ugh. and the, <laughs> the waiter shames her and they're like, Mom, that's veal. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's that's one funny. point. Uh, I would honestly, uh, what well, I mean, now Matt's talked about the, the torture of an animal. I mean, yeah, I've really put you in a corner. I've, yes. Uh, are we mi- we've got to be misinterpreting the question, right? Yeah. Reinvent the veal? Is that supposed to be like wheel? Well, I guess a, I don't know. Pun yeah. on veal. I'm going to go. I'm going to be the dog and cat king because that would be pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, same. And I know they don't necessarily understand that, but I mean, I sort of feel like I thrive in situations where I'm trying to control things that can't be controlled. <laughs> yeah, you right. know, that's the energy I have every day. Yeah, so it suits me. Sick. Oh well, that works out well. I mean. I've already reinvented the veal anyway, so yeah. it wasn't much for you Thanks left for to doing do. That. Uh, thank you for that question, Maine. Great question. I think that might be a Welsh name. And another thing we like to do is thank a few other patrons who've been supporting us for some time on the shout out level, which I believe is the Ars Prod or maybe the DB Cooper level. It's one of those. Ars Prod. Ars Prod. It's the Ars Prod. <laughs> and uh, named after Dave's old job title, he's now full time. Full time prod. prod, baby. <laughs> ass is out. Dave's ass is out. He's just prodding. And uh, we normally have some sort of a game. 
I remember these ones always being a bit trickier. Oh, yeah. Find a theme. Let's just say what kind of car they drive. Okay, and what great. colour it is. What car? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if I could kick us off, I'd love to thank from Seabrook right here in Victoria, Kyra Jacobson. <gasps> Kyra Jacobson uh, being, is Seabrook on the water? Is C? Sea... It's got to be, surely. Now I'm doubting that. A brook is water and sea is water. That's two Chances waters each together. Other. Yeah, those things. That, that makes absolute <laughs> sense. Um, Seabrook is not. It's a, it's a suburb. Oh, in the Bay Area. Anyway, I, regardless, Kyra exclusively gets around in a uh, jet ski, on a jet ski. Seabrook is near the water, yes. Oh, so even <laughs> when she's not on the water, is she... Does the jet ski have wheels as well? Yeah. Oh, That's cool. They, they kind of they fold out on like, water, like water. out of a plane, you know? That's sick. That's real sick. That's so cool. I love it. And what colour is it? Jet ski plane. Um, it is purple. Nice. That's cool. Yeah, it's the regal colour. But it's like a, it's like a cool kind of it's like a graffitied purple. It looks sick, actually. <laughs> that's cool. So pretty sick paint job on it. Wow. A jet ski that's like graffitied purple. That is bad. That is sick. That is real sick. Good on ya. All right. Cheers, Kara. I'd also love to thank from Pen Coed in... This has got to be that's Wales. A, that's Wales. How do you say Wales properly? Oh. Oh, shit, I don't remember. Oh, no. We're the worst. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to... I'll get this. You know how... I mean, we've been talking about this episode, how good I am at pronouncing things. And Welsh. Oh, my God, I just pronounce, <laughs> pronounce it. <laughs> Welsh is typically an there. easy language oh, as well. Yes, an easy one, so... And I'm pretty sure I've met this person. Um, at one of our shows, and they tried to get me to spell their name and I could not do it. <clears throat> I'd also love to thank, from Pen Coed in Cymru, in Great Britain, Dafford Howell Stone. Oh, Dafford. Well pronounced. Dafford, who obviously drives a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yep. 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 yep, yep, yep what yep, colour's yep, the dragon? Yep, yep. Big red dragon. Fuck yeah. Is it red on the flag? Is it? Yeah. It's red. Yeah, big red Again, dragon. Again, I've got to ask, does it have wheels for the road? <laughs> of course it does. <laughs> it's got wings for the air and wheels for it. the road. This baby can go on all terrain. What about water? How does it get across water? Oh, it flies across it. No, no, it swims. Oh, right on. <laughs> <laughs> really slowly. <laughs> Everyone's like, can't you just fly? Not everyone, just Daphne. <laughs> Please. Can't you just fly? Come on. It's just a puddle. Why do we have to go so slowly across it? And it pants go, no, you swim water, you don't fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Daffod, for your support. I'd also love to thank, again from Victorian Pakenham, the great suburb of Pakenham, Jess Wooster. Jess Wooster. Dave, what does Jess drive? I've got the feeling that she's going back to the future in her very own DeLorean. <gasps> yeah. And it is lime green. Oh, the best colour. Thank you. The De DeLorean, the inventor of the DeLorean and the invention is DeLorean. <laughs> Here we go. Was, Here we uh, go. <laughs> was in the, in the vote for the... For the bloody block. Really? There's some chance it's the number one topic. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Hmm. Apparently it was a quite a wild dream and it was a horrible uh, flop. Oh. But, yeah. <laughs> it's disappointing. Being brought back. So, Jess Worcester in the DeLorean. In some ways the coolest so far. Although all three have been very cool. Very, in their own very ways. cool. May I thank some people as well? Please. Please. I would love to thank from Manchester... NH has to be New Hampshire. I believe so. Yeah. Oh, my God. I reckon. Oh, I went out on a limb and I felt my whole body tense. Which is then, uh, as you guys paused. directly next door to Vermont, famous for bed tundi. So. Oh, that made me uncomfortable. Um, and also creamy. Oh, I reckon you'd be able to get a creamy in New Hampshire. There'd be enough border there Easily. to get a creamy. Well, hopefully someone... But they put jam on first. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully someone in Manchester 
has had their fair share of creamies. It's Jill Stewart. Oh, oh Cuz. Cousin Jill. Thank you, Jill. Cousin Jill. She well, she probably have very similar tastes in cars to me. So she's driving a 1978 XC Ford Falcon. Oh, fantastic. In beautiful green. Oh, wow. Is it like a like a moss green, like a deep green? No, like a bluey, bluey green. Ooh. Okay. A bluey green with a nice sheen. Love that. Yeah. I'm still not entirely sure what. So it's like a dark color. Is it really light? Is because like a bluey green could be aqua. It's a light. Yeah. It's it's to, It's not quite aqua. No. It's not like a matte color like that. It's more of a shimmery. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I'm going to leave some of it up to Jill. I've given her some detail there. She can finish. Just make it shimmery, essentially. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Great. Well, there you go, Jill. Enjoy. Enjoy that project. Um, I'd also love to thank from Greenbelt, MD. What's MD? Maryland. Maryland. <laughs> thank you, Dave. I'd love to thank Stephanie Calhoun. Oh, uh, Rory Calhoun. That's got to be Calhoun, right? <laughs> yeah. I love Calhoun as a name. Fantastic. I reckon it's come up before. Because remember when uh, one of the puppies in the Simpsons spoof of 101 Dalmatians and Burns says one of the dogs reminds him of a young Rory <laughs> Calhoun. Right. <laughs> Isn't Calhoun such a great surname? It's so I have good. no idea. I think Rory Calhoun might have been an actor or something in the olden days, but well, great name. Stephanie Calhoun is the Stephanie Calhoun. owner of a special place in our hearts. Um, and Stephanie gets around in a tugboat. Oh, oh. that is cool. I they love look little, boats. but they're so How strong. How are they that strong? It's amazing. I don't get it. I'm a little tugboat. I love them. I love tugboats. Love tugboats. Hate boats. submarines. Love tugboats. From Bethlehem in PA, Pennsylvania. Yes. <laughs> You're on fire. <laughs> I would love to thank Shay Baum. Oh, Shay Baum, one of my favourite football journalists. Is Greg born? Oh wow! Do you know what kind so, of car Greg going. drives? Or oh, I mean, he he's a real. I mean, he, it's he's got one of the deepest voices that's ever been, but he's mainly a writer, and he just writes. He writes beautifully about sport. He makes it sound more interesting than it probably deserves to. That's cool. Um, but uh, yeah, what car would he have? It wouldn't be too flashy. It'd pro- I picture something like a. You know, like a Datsun 120B. Oh, okay. That's not right, but he's probably no. I think he'd probably he would have updated since then. It's probably he probably drives a Nissan Maxima. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh. With a what about a spoiler? We're we talking a spoiler or? You got a spoiler? No, 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 no. Not no a show. fancy stuff. It's all about. Does he have no, an eight CD changer in the trunk? Oh yeah, big time. And a sub. Oh wow! Whoa! So the Whoa. so the boot voice. is basically useless because it's already taken off. Yeah, it's a useless boot. <laughs> <laughs> There's room for CDs, <laughs> and that's it. Well, wow. is that also the same? So I imagine Shay drives the same car. That's what Shay has. Yeah, the American version of the Nissan uh, Maxima that Greg drives. <laughs> so it's just yeah, same well, car on the other other side of the yeah, road. Other side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they have them over there, um, she got it. Shay got it um, sent over from here. So Shay's got a. Uh, the steering wheel on the wrong oh, wow. side. But. I was going to say, because some people have had, we've had a tugboat and a drag and really exciting stuff, but Nissan Maxima, <laughs> less exciting. But if it's on the wrong, the steering wheel's on the wrong side, we're back to exciting, I think. It's a bit interesting. Yes. Shay is a, Shay is a unisex name, isn't it? So, Shay, great name. Another great name. Yeah, I like name. Shay. Well, on your Shay, good luck driving. Dave, do you want to uh, thank I a few? would love to thank now from Kent in Washington... That's that's all these Amer like I've been blindsided three times with yeah. British names that have turned yeah, I was out to be almost certain I was about to look over and see that that was UK Kent, but it's in Washington. Jessica R. Gruber. Oh, fantastic! Uh, which of course name. reminds me of uh, Hans Gruber Hans. in Die Hard, mm. of course. Yeah, and uh, and what would he drive? Something German? Oh, yes, I'm absolutely, guessing. like a um, a, a Porsche. Oh, what color? Uh, a yellow 1969 Porsche 911. Ah, oh, summer of love. Yellow. Yeah. Porsche, they look good in yellow, I reckon. Okay. Like that sort of. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Driving around, around Washington. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great Looks absolutely choice. absolutely fantastic. Great choice, Jessica Gruber. 
Are we having even better surnames than normal? It feels that way, yes. Absolute cracking ones here. I would also like to thank now from London and not in America, amazingly, in <laughs> Great Britain. Did you know they had one? Um, it is Marissa Ladent or Ladent. Marissa. Oh. I think I've got the feeling that Marissa is driving around in um, like a truck that is also a parade float. So on the back there's like a Thanksgiving oh, yeah. scene oh. with like a giant turkey on the back, which is a, All year uh, round. Yeah, is a nightmare to park. But for that one special week in another country, <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That. Seems like a bit of a nightmare, actually. I would, I would be suggesting to Marissa to maybe, you should maybe upgrade. London, a, a country, a city that's known for its ease of parking. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marissa. Good luck driving that. And finally, I would like to thank from Western Australia, from Sawyer's Valley, and uh, it's a name that we've already mentioned on the show. I would like to thank Nathan Damon. Nathan. Nathan, what a day for Damon. Holy moly. What a day big, for Damon. Big West Coast fan. Um, obviously, he wishes he was in the, the grand final. Is there a chance? Oh, what about uh, their first grand final was played in 1991 against uh, the Haw- Hawthorne Hawks. No one calls them the Hawthorne Hawks. <laughs> against the Hawks. And they uh, they did lose, but it was their first time playing there. And famously, the... <laughs> The entertainment that day was Angry Anderson <laughs> singing Bound for Glory in the back of a weird blue bat, <laughs> Which recently got sold. Yeah. But, uh, and you know who bought it? Nathan Damon. <laughs> you know what's so funny about that? I was going to suggest the Batmobile, but I had no idea that the West, Co- West Coast played in that final. So that is... R- I was about, that's, what, that? that's what that I was really leading up to. So, Matt, yeah, wild. honestly. <laughs> that's awesome. Well done. Nathan Damon, you and Angry Anderson making history. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> you're both bound for glory <laughs> and you're both bad boys for love. <laughs> Check one, fucking two. And that's a, that of, that's obviously yeah, the band that the bass player Mike checked in Germany when I saw him. Check one, fucking two. <laughs> and that's how we Mike check every so single funny. live show. <laughs> so, it's between that and the 12th man's... Uh, did you get the check? Did you get the check? <laughs> check one, two, check one, two. Did you get but the check? But of course, if you're being a real professional, you do the Dave Warnicky special of aha, uh-huh, aha, uh-huh. yes, <laughs> yes, aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Check one, aha. Uh-huh. Sounds like a 90s pop <laughs> sensation. Check one. Aha, uh-huh, aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> check, check, aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like it. Oh, well, that just brings us to the the final section of the show. So thanks to everyone that supports us uh, on Patreon. And there's some people that have been doing so for a long, long, long time. And if they've been doing it for three years, with no drop-off, uh, and at the shout-out level or above, we'd like to thank them again for their ongoing service by welcoming them into an exclusive club. And normally in this club, the Triptych Club, I'm standing there at the door with the clipboard with... The, all the names on the list, ticking them off, and I'm doing that again. Jess is inside. She's in charge of drinks. She's behind the bar, but she's also in charge of hors d'oeuvres, and uh, there's a team there putting these together, and let me tell you, they're always fantastically presented. Uh, Dave books the band, and he also hypes people in as they come in. Then Jess hypes Dave. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful person. system. That's right. So we've built this up to be... Too big now, really. But anyway, Jess, what have we got in terms of food and drink? Well, for drinks this week, obviously, we've got some um, Bundaberg rum. Oh, very cheeky. Poor taste. Poor taste. Nothing, that's fine. Have a Bundy. (laughs) 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 It's my dad's go-to drink. Um, Jeez, that couldn't have been good for business for Bundy rum, could it? Yeah. Far enough away. Proximity, I don't know. Corona. Beers. Yeah, I wonder. I should ask my parents if they remember it all going down. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, so yeah, we've got some we've got, you know, bun your classic Bundy and Coke, but you know, these days they are branching a little more into something a bit more refreshing. Bundy with a ginger beer. We've got some Bundy based cocktails also. But the main the the real um hero piece of this week is the Bundy. Um <laughs> and then drink uh, hors d'oeuvres wise. Just some like uh, cheese bickies. Ah, uh, classic. Not and not and not nice like fancy cheese and crackers. Like they're a bit. Oh, shit. so nothing nice. Great. Good to hear it. Um, nothing nice this week. Good to hear it. Well, you don't deserve it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 
to our great trip ditch. Well, don't worry. No, all the all the uh, previous hors d'oeuvres are still there. I'm just adding every time. It's honestly, it's too much now. There, there are times where I just want to eat something that's not that good, probably for nostalgia. Absolutely. Like, you know, childhood food was often not great. And, uh, yeah, that's why I occasionally I love to get a shitty pizza. Yeah. Or, yeah, like a bit of crap cheese. You know what country you can go to for that kind of pizza? <laughs> Don't start this again. <laughs> it's not Italy. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, Dave. You know they're sensitive to their, their. We'll get a lot of pizza defenders again from from Great Britain. I mean, they probably do other. They foods do baked beans. Well. You just don't. Jack- you don't know any different. Jack potato. You're from there. No, I think they. I'm sure they do have very good pizza. I mean, Gordon Ramsay's from England, isn't he? Yeah, he's known Is for it? his pizza. Yeah. His fucking pizza. <laughs> You'd assume he could put together a good pizza, surely. Yeah. A lot of famous chefs are from there. We just had uh, shit pizza. Okay. Yes. All right. Maggie Beers. No, she's, she's ours. Ja- she's ours. Jamie. Who's their Jamie one? Oliver. Nigella. Oh, Heston. Who's been? Heston? Who's the one who's named in a in an idol song? Uh. Anyway. Uh. So, Dave, who's the band? Let me look that up while you well, check the band. I mean, cheese and biscuits is a little bit of basics, but uh, nothing basic about this group. We're going Backstreet's back, all right. No That's right. Way. We have uh, four of the five Backstreet Boys appearing. I'm afraid we got them. That uh, we finally got them. I'm afraid which one uh, Kevin missing? couldn't make it, but the others uh. they'll all be there. So don't worry about it. Because <laughs> that, like, normally that happens. <laughs> No, that happens because one of them's going on to be a big star. You know, like yeah. Robbie Williams from Take That. <laughs> Maybe that was the only time that happened. Or J- Justin Timberlake from NC. Yeah. But Backstreet Boys, I'm assuming they're yeah, all about But them. not Kevin, I'm afraid. Who's the Kevin? The tallest one, you know? <laughs> oh, the tallest I'm looking one. at him now. That's how I know that. The oh, tallest well one. He's Brian's cousin. Brian is also in the band. <laughs> No, they were cousins. I wasn't a big Backstreet Boys fan. Not up now. Um, he's from Lexington, Kentucky. His other name, his nickname on Wikipedia is Train. So there you go. I don't know what that means. But Why? don't worry about it. Kevin's not there. Everyone else is. Everyone else is there. So stop focusing on Kevin. Start focusing on Howie. <laughs> is it even worth seeing him if Kevin's not there? Focus. Who else, Dave? Howie. Yeah, Howie, Nick Carter, oh, Nick Brian, Carter. and, of course, AJ. AJ McLean. Yeah. So. Do you think Nick Carter, because Kevin's Kevin not Carter. coming, obviously, do you think Nick uh, could bring his brother Aaron Carter? Absolutely. Yes. The famous Carter family. From the famous uh, short lived. Johnny Cash married short lived reality show. Anyway. Yes. And it was Mary Mary Berry's, the, uh. Uh, the English baker or whatever I was trying to think of. Anyhow, there's one inductee <laughs> only this week into the. Please tell me it's Club. Kevin. That's why I couldn't appear. <laughs> it's. It's not. You ready to All hop right, up, Dave? All right, here we go. Welcome on down. Yes, you ready to yeah. hop up, Dave? I'm ready. Come on, Dave. Here we go. Woo! All right. Welcome them in to the Triptych Club this week from East Coromel in New South Wales, Australia. It's Kim Hill. Oh, Kim, you ain't over the hill. Come on in. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Woo! He did it. That's good. That's one of your Thank best you in so. weeks, I reckon. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> oh, Remember when we complimented each other before? <laughs> oh, wait, what? That was one of your best in weeks. How have you taken but, that negatively? I genuinely meant that was oh, a really good so one. Much. All right, let's boot this. Yeah, I think this is hill. now the longest episode ever. We keep breaking that record week after week. It's amazing. Sorry, everybody. Oh, boot our home, guys. Four down. There's one episode left in block. We've had some cracking topics. Uh, some really epic stuff has been covered so far with some huge reports. What could possibly be number one? I will come back next week and let you know. Tune in then, uh, get in contact between now and then at dogoonpod.com. All the links to our Patreon that we mentioned, we can get all the bonus episodes. We are 85 plus bonus episodes up there that you can access right now. So uh, jump on, support the show if you want to. Uh, Also, you can get in contact on our social medias or follow us at dogoonpod. We've got an email, dogoonpod at gmail.com. And we also have a YouTube channel where you can see some of our previous live shows. And also our web series. Uh, just search Do Go On on YouTube and a bunch of stuff will come up. But apart from that, I think uh, that's all we have to say. And until next week, I personally will say thank you. And I will say goodbye. Thank you and later. Thank you and bye. This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network.